All right. <laughs> YouTube is now up and running. It should be correct. And let me go here and go here and go here. All right. And this baby needs to be deleted right here. Nope, 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 nope. And edit video. Sorry, you guys, just hold tight. I promise I've got some really interesting news to share with you. All right. Yeah. Well, I'll have to fix that part later. Yeah, I'll have to fix that part later. Okay. So my friends on YouTube, you should be back. <laughs> so let's start all over again. <laughs> so my name is Jill Osborne. I'm the founder of the IC Network. I'm also the national IC support group leader. And my purpose in doing these live meetings is to bring what I consider the best in the world to you. Uh, back 30 years ago, when I built the first website on IC, I had one goal. There were so many patients who didn't have access to good health care. There were so many patients who didn't have access to urologists who were informed and educated. I wanted to bring the world's best resources to those patients who were isolated. And that's still what we're doing 30 years later. And my job with these meetings is to educate you, to inform you, to give you a necessary kick in the tush if you need a necessary kick in the tush, et cetera, et cetera. We are live streaming right now on Facebook and YouTube. Um, uh, normally when I do these meetings, I do a little 30 minute intro and then I will take your questions. I will answer questions as long as you would like me to answer questions. Now, um, so the first thing I want to start with is I just kicked off literally 30 minutes ago a brand new clinical trial. So we have now our third clinical trial of the year. They have asked me to kick it off this week. If you visit the IC Network website, icnetwork.org, you'll see it right under the latest research. And um, this is yet another therapy that shows uh, some significant promise in perhaps reducing the symptoms of IC and the pain and discomfort of IC. So this is called the OAG150 study. So I'm going to read this to you right now. Living with bladder pain and discomfort, you got to learn about the OAG150 study over on the IC Network website. If symptoms of interstitial cystitis or bladder pain, like urinary symptoms or discomfort, impact everyday activities, you may qualify for a study. The OAG150 a study is testing an investigational medication that is designed to help alleviate the symptoms of IC. This is a tablet that will be taken once daily before bedtime. You can join this study if you are a woman between the ages of 18 and 70. If you've been diagnosed with IC or bladder pain syndrome or have been experiencing bladder pain, pressure, discomfort, accompanied by a frequent need for urination, not due to other causes like an infection, are willing to travel to the clinic up to nine times for an eight-week study treatment, and you're willing to use a computer or cell phone to monitor and record your information daily about the pattern of your pain and urination. There are other requirements for participating in the study. If you are eligible and choose to participate, the study team will discuss these study requirements, procedures, and your rights and responsibilities with you. Participation in the IC, I, OAG 1050 study will last 3.5 months and requires up to nine visits to the study site. If you qualify, you will receive at no cost access to the investig investigational medication, careful evaluation, and frequent monitoring of your condition, and the opportunity to help advance the treatment of interstitial cystitis and bladder pain syndrome. Um, and so after this meeting, 
you will be able to come on over to our website, not before, but after this meeting, because I'm going to make it private right now. Uh, so give me one quick sec. Because I I need I, I saw a typo in there and I get very embarrassed by typos. So I'm going to fix that after the meeting. This is your chance yet again to be at the cutting edge of IC. Now, here's the deal. What is a clinical trial? And, you know, you know, it's so interesting for anybody who's on Netflix. I watched while I was doing Christmas cards last night, I watched a um, a documentary about a doctor who was transplanting windpipes with a replacing a windpipe with a piece of plastic that he said was coated with stem cells. And this was back at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden back 10 years ago. And it turned out that the doctor was a complete charlatan, basically made stuff up. Uh, and one really critical thing happened, aside from the fact that he lied about everything and patients died, um, is he did not do the proper clinical trial preparation. That whenever we're trying to bring a new treatment to market, there is a very clear set of testing that has to be done to make sure this is safe. So they will start with laboratory testing, which is called uh, in vitro testing, which is, does not involve any animals. Then they will go to in vivo testing, which is where they're doing baseline important research to make sure that this is safe et cetera, et cetera. Once they pass the animal testing, then they go through phase testing for clinical trials, phase one, phase two, phase three. Um, I'm not allowed to say a lot about any of the clinical trials that I talk about. I will, uh, because the information is very, very, mm, I, um, how do I want to say this? Uh, they have to go through an IRB approval process, and I'm only allowed to say what the IRB committee allows me to say. Cli clinical trials to me are hope. They are proof to you that the IC research movement is alive and kicking. They are proof to you that if you haven't failed, if you haven't found success with other treatments. Here are some new treatments that you could potentially try. They are proof to you that there is hope. And so I always get very, very, very excited when a company calls me with a new clinical trial. And I'm very vocal about what I expect to see in a clinical trial. I was part of the National Institutes of Health meeting a year ago, deciding the future of IC research. And, and um, you know, sometimes what happens is researchers get stuck in the science. And while the science is fascinating, I'm much more interested in finding something that has the potential of helping more people quickly. Because I know you're suffering. And we want to try to get you through and out of that suffering stage, because believe me, I have been there. So we now have three clinical trials on the IC Network website. The latest one I will have back up tonight after this meeting that you should be looking at if you are not responding to treatment. You know, what do our guidelines say? The IC guidelines say if you're not responding to therapy, if you're getting worse rather than better, stop what you're doing, take a step back, revisit the diagnosis. What have we missed? Because here's what we know from the last 30 years that I've been involved and basically the last 40 years. Bladder treatments often don't work. Why? Because there are structures beyond the bladder that can be involved or it might not be the bladder wall. It might be relating to a nerve that's, an, that's innervating the bladder. It might be relating to muscles. And so you are truly an anatomical mystery to be solved here. And, you know, I mean, it's so interesting because um, I, take, I take phone calls almost every single day. 
And I always um, am quite intrigued and a little bit frustrated and a little bit um, challenged by those patients who call, who just say, Jill, I've done this and this and this and this and this and nothing's worked. And I'm like, okay, let's not talk about that right away. I want to try to understand your body a little bit. So tell me, how old are you? How old were you when your symptoms started? Was there any event that you associate with your onset of symptoms? And we kind of work through this kind of script that I have that I use when I'm when I'm working with with patients and doing coaching for patients. And so for those of you who are struggling, number one, we want to go back to phenotyping. We want to make sure we understand what we're treating here. We want to make sure we know, like I was working with a patient late on Friday who uh, is so, so interesting because her IC symptoms had been coming and going. Mm, how old was she? She was like 32. I see symptoms started at like 18 on really, really, really confused, had done a lot of treatments, nothing had worked. And yet nobody had asked her just like really basic questions like, okay, so tell me, uh, how old were you when it began? And is there anything that you think triggered it? Oh, well, yeah, I fell off a horse. Hello, hello, Sue, if you're watching, <laughs> Sue can relate to this because Sue is one of our members whose symptoms also began after falling off of a horse. The challenge with riding a bicycle and riding a horse is that literally you're, as you're sitting with your legs spread, the saddle is pushing directly up inside your pelvis, directly onto muscles and nerves. There is a legacy to that. And if you have been a horseback rider for a long period of time, and, and I was a horseback rider, I rode English. My sister was a very, very good horseback rider. Um, for those of us who've been who've ridden horses and fallen off of horses, those are not little falls. Those are very, very big falls. But one of the, one of the things that happens if you ride horses and you're an English rider rather than a Western rider, a Western rider has a big giant saddle with a big saddle horn, you know, think cowboy. An English rider is, think Olympics, you know, they're jump, you're jumping or you're doing something called dressage. Well, one of the things that happens in English riding is something called posting. So when you're trotting, you're not, you're not sitting like this. No, you're not sitting like this. This is that natural roll of a trot or a canter or a lope on a Western you're kind of just sitting like this and your body's getting into the groove of the horse, et cetera, et cetera. But when you're riding English, you do something called posting. And that is where you lift your butt up and down, up and down, up and down in time with the rhythm of the horse. So what does that mean then? You're going down on your pelvic floor, up, down on your pelvic floor, up, down on your pelvic floor, up. And I do believe that that causes a lot of trauma over time. So with this patient that I was working with, it was like, okay, bladder treatments haven't worked. They were getting ready to do bladder installations. We go through phenotyping. We're showing signs of pelvic floor. We're also showing signs of bladder wall challenging. And then she shares that she's a horseback rider. And then she shares that she was a very big horseback rider. And that really solidified in my mind that I think her case began with a muscle issue. Muscle trauma over time led to tight pelvic floor muscles over time, which eventually led to ischemia in the bladder from reduced blood circulation from those tight pelvic floor muscles, which then led to bladder wall sensitivity. And that's something that's just a very classic presentation. We now know that 80 to 85% uh, of IC patients have tight pelvic floor muscles. So again, if you're not responding to therapy, we want to get back in there and phenotype you and really try to understand what could be driving the problem. But let's say you're bladder wall anyway, and you're not responding to bladder wall therapies. This is where clinical trials are really, really important because these are new ways of addressing the bladder wall. 
So I kind of did a, a big circle around that story there. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, uh, so anyway, I, I'm just really thrilled and excited that we have yet something else that will be available around the country. Uh, on our second uh, trial, I have all the trial centers listed by state on our website so that you can see if they're close to you or not. And remember this treatment, it's free. And by participating, you have access to the best IC doctors in the country, if not in the world. You have access to the new, in, in, in the new therapies under investigation. And you are giving a gift to the IC world because you are helping us understand if this is valuable or not, if this is useful or not. And remember, because they've already gone through early studies, it all it appears to be promising. Now, one of the examples of one that failed clinical trials ultimately in the end, um, well, there, there are several actually. Uh, BCG, B Bacillus Kelmet guerin, was uh, is used for bladder cancer. And about 10, 15 years ago, they thought, well, maybe this will help with IC. And it's where they put something very harsh. It kind of strips off the bladder wall. It's a de deactivated tuberculin bacteria or whatever. Um, and it failed. And it is no longer used for IC at all. And then we have other studies uh, or other therapies which have never gone through clinical trials, which probably should, especially anything that they're going to put in your bladder. Now, also, guys, I want you to make a massive, massive promise to me. You will never, ever, 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 can I hear another ever, let anyone put anything in your bladder without telling you exactly what it is. You may never give your power away. If a doctor says, hey, I'd like to try a bladder treatment, you're going to say, interesting. What do you propose it's going to be? And if they say, well, we're going to do an old treatment called silver nitrate. And you're going to say, well, isn't that interesting? Because that's not even mentioned as a treatment for IC. Uh, so what do you think this is going to do for me? And if the doctor says, ah, oh, we've used it for a lot of patients over the years, let's just give it a shot. You're going to say, no, thank you. Because if it's not even mentioned in the IC guidelines, there's an important reason why it has not been found helpful. If you have a doctor who says, and, and you know, I got to tell you a story. I had a patient who, um, uh, first appointment, first freaking appointment. At the at her urologist, the nurse comes in, empties her bladder for a clean catch urine sample, and then puts silver nitrate in her bladder. No informed consent, no discussion. She is laying on the table screaming, What did you just put in my bladder? And the nurse goes, and this was this wasn't long ago. This was maybe just slightly before COVID, the nurse goes, oh, we do it for everybody. It'll be okay. No, that is not okay. Do not let anybody put anything in your bladder without you getting the full information. Another case that, I, I, that strikes me as something that, that's very, very memorable was a woman who was in TRICARE because her husband was in the military. And it was in Texas and she had a bad IC flare. And they decided to do bladder infusions of silver nitrate. Now, silver nitrate and chlorpactin, again, are bladder strippers. They used them back in the old days where the assumption was we had a damaged bladder wall. Let's just strip the damaged bladder wall take it off and maybe a whole new bladder wall will grow. And of course, we, we've known for years that that doesn't work. Anyway, so here we have this young girl, I see, husband in the military, ends up at a VA hospital. And the doctor goes, oh, we're going to do an infusion. They admitted her for three days. She had a catheter in her bladder for three days, infusing caustic silver nitrate. 
And if that wasn't bad enough, they increased the dose every day. And by the third day, again, she was hysterical. And her husband called me begging, what are they doing? What are they doing? Help me. My wife is screaming. And my answer back was, we don't do that anymore. That's not in the IC guidelines. There's no support for that anymore. And hopefully you got her the hell out of there. So again, I want you to promise me, promise me, you will never let anybody put anything in your bladder without asking you. All right, hold on a sec. So we've had a lot of people come in and I'm a little, I got to tell you, I'm a little worked up and I'm going to ask for your help on something. But I'm a, I'm, I'm a wee bit, um, frustrated right now about something else. And you might hear that in my story. But anyway, I mean, in my voice. Uh, hello, Angel. Hello, Donna. Hello, Rachel. Hello, Alicia. Angel says they're scheduling my surgery for the sling. Okay, interesting. Make sure you ask them how they're going to do it. Are they going to use mesh? Are they going to use your own tissue? It's a very, very important discussion you need to have with your doctor before they do that. Uh, Lamo says, I'm suffering IC since 2014. Now I'm very much in pain when I fill, when urine fills my bladder. I have pain in my pelvic floor. I can't sit and walk a long time. I'm going to pee at night every hour. I pay, I have pain mostly in my left side of my vagina, and it's also very difficult to pee. Honey, have you had a pelvic floor assessment? Because you're describing a problem with your muscles on the left side. When your muscles are tight, it gets hard to release urine. Hello, Curtis. And Angel says they're using your tissues. All right, let me come here to Facebook and then I'm going to ask for your help on something personal because I have needs too. <laughs> um, hello, Gay. Nice to see you. I'm good. I'm stressed, but I'm good. Hello, Anne. Hi, Paula. Hello, Renee. Hi, Nikki. Hi, Ginger. Hi, Erin. I am feeling better. I'm just kind of emotional. Renee says, love the Christmas trees. Thank you. That's my theme this year. We're doing, we're doing frosty snowflakes this year. Thank you, Ginger. The site is located at icnetwork.org. Let me move this here. Uh, what do you, okay, hold on one sec. Judy says, what do you recommend as a good seat cushion for traveling in a car? I have a brand new cushion. Hold on. Let me go get it. Hold on. Okay. So hold on a sec. Let me get you the cushion. <laughs> okay, let's talk chair cushions for a moment. <laughs> um, uh, Lama over here on YouTube said, I can't sit and walk for a long time. Anytime you have trouble sitting or walking, that's muscles and nerves. That's neuromuscular. The bladder does not cause pain sitting or walking. Your pelvic floor causes pain sitting or walking. And if your pelvic floor is so tight that it's squeezing a nerve, you're going to get sciatica. You're going to get clitoral pain. You're going to get a vibration. You might have rectal pain. You might have vaginal pain. You might have, you know, the pelvis um, is a very small confined area that a lot of stuff is happening and those muscles and nerves interweave with everything else. And when those muscles and nerves get messed up, you get lots of different symptoms. So for me, I um, I used to be able to sit for 15 hours and work. When I started the IC network, listen, hon, I could sit here, I could sit here for hours and hours and write stuff on IC and program and all that sort of stuff. 
And slowly but surely over time, it got harder and harder for me to sit down. And I started having a lot of urethral pain and a lot of vaginal pain. And we had a physical therapist come to our support group who brought a chair cushion. It was the old chair cushion that we sold for 25 years that unfortunately COVID shut the factory down. But it was this design. So the advantage of this cushion is it has a groove down the middle. So each butt cheek is supported, but nothing like it's pushing up against muscles and nerves and anything tender, your tender bits. So think the exact opposite of a saddle. And, and in fact, I actually have cowboys and I actually had a squadron commander, F F-16 or F-18 squadron commander uh, call and try to order the cushion for his plane. And I'm like, I'm not taking your money. I'm sending it to you free. And I sent him a whole bunch of them. Okay. So th these can be adapted in many, many ways. But the point is, there's a groove down the middle. Nothing is touching your tender bits. So if I'm having rectal pain, hemorrhoid pain, vulvodynia, this is a cushion to go to. Now, again, the old cushion that we had, which is very affordable, uh, the factory shut down three years ago. So this comes from another company, Pelvic Pain Solutions. It's twice as expensive. So it's going to be more in the 60 rather than in $30 range, somewhere in there. Um, but it's a better cushion than our old one by far. Better material, better fabric, better design, better foam. It will last much longer than the old IC network bladder and prostate friendly chair cushion. So we have these cushions right now in the IC network shop. Now, let me get this one. The second cushion that we have that I was sitting on, this is called the waffle cushion. So you can see it's got air in it, but it doesn't have a lot of air in it. When you sit on it, basically the air assembles underneath your butt cheek and you've got about this much of air. But the advantage of this is you're not sitting on anything hard. So if I'm having pain in my left butt cheek or my right butt cheek, which is where most of my pain is now, this is the cushion that I go with, the waffle cushion. This cushion can last a long time if you don't have cats. If you have a cat uh, with nails uh, and they jump up on it, they're going to puncture it and it's going to go flat. So this is, um, this is a great cushion. It's really easy to clean, but it's also really easy to break. Um, but this is my standard go-to for me personally with my pelvic floor dysfunction. Okay, so that's the waffle cushion. This is much cheaper than the other one. Now, another design for a cushion is this. It's a U-shape. And technically, you can sit on it like this or you can sit on it like this, depending upon when you're, where your pain is. If your pain is by your rectum, then you, you have the groove in the back. If your pain is up front by your prostate or your urethra, you do it this way. So this is another cushion from Pelvic Pain Solutions that quite a few patients have used. Um, but this is very cool. So I got a phone call last month from a young woman who's just started her own, her own uh, chair cushion company. And I got to say, she nailed it. She nailed it. So this uh, cushion is now available in the IC Network shop and it's by a company called Ergo Value. So it's a, it's a um, groove cushion, but it has a longer groove exceptional fabric, fantastic fabric. And it's got this kind of plastic back that will cling to your car seat or whatever chair you're sitting on really well. But the magic is in the memory foam. Oh my goodness. This, let me sit on it.
So this is a, you can tell I'm I'm sitting up now, but you can see I'm you know so it lifted me up about two inches, but now it's settling in, and now now I probably have maybe maybe an inch inch and a half of foam between the bottom of the seat cushion and um, uh, my butt, and it's so comfortable, like I'm shocked. Now, what's interesting about this chair cushion is it's very heat or cold sensitive. When it gets super, super cold, it gets really firm. When it gets super warm, it gets softer. And so right now we have their firms, which I would really consider a medium. And they just sent me their soft sample. And I don't know if we're going to carry their soft sample. They feel very similar to me. But this chair cushion... Oh, 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 wait a second. And um, it has a handle. You're not going to be embarrassed taking this anywhere. And you can take, um, there, where is it? You can take the cover off and wash it. So if anybody wants to try these new chair cushions, they're over in the IC Network shop. I think they're $65. I'm going to tell you right now, these are the I think that these are the best cushions that we have had. And I'm going to be very, very interested to hear what you think. So, um, and the, I will tell you, I have in my... I have in my closet here another three or four cushions that I bought and tested. Stay away from the purple ones, the big foamy jelly-like ones. They don't work. They're too hard. Uh, every cushion that comes out, I buy, I test personally because I'm somebody who has had a lot of pain with sitting. So hopefully that answered your question. Uh, Judy. <laughs> Kayleen, hey girl, how you doing? Christina said, if it's pelvic floor tension, would you see a pelvic floor specialist as opposed to an IC specialist? Yeah, you would definitely want to see a pelvic floor physical therapist. A urologist is not going to provide the physical therapy you need to get these muscles healthy. I, and you know, you know me, for those of you who have listened and watched me for a year, I tend to be a wee bit passive aggressive with mine. And it just, you have to stop yourself when you feel your muscles getting tight and work on them. The whole point is to be independent. So you go to the physical therapist, you have the proper pelvic floor assessment, you have physical therapy, but in the end, we want you to be able to recognize when your muscles are getting tight. We want you to be able to step in and treat at home so that you're not dependent on somebody who might not be available for a month. We don't want you to be in a pelvic floor flare for a month. We want you to have the skills so that you can nip it in the bud at home, right? Hello, Diane. Hello, Linda. Linda says, I'm going to have a cystoscope with hydrodistension in February. I know one time you talked about high something, low something. I'm sorry, I can't remember it exactly. I think it had to do with the amount of water they put in. I hope that makes sense. It does. Totally, Linda. In the old days, they used to do something called a high-pressure, long-duration hydrodistension because back in the old days, 10 years or more ago, they thought the more water you put in the bladder under pressure, the more you stretch the bladder to improve bladder capacity, the better the result. But of course, we learned back, they, back then that, oh, if you do that to an injured bladder, the bladder will rupture. And so ever since we've had AUA guidelines starting in 2011, they have very specifically said, please don't do that anymore. Please do not over distend the bladder anymore. Our goal is to minimize trauma, not create trauma. And so today, hydrodistensions are supposed to be low pressure, short duration. Using less water for a shorter period of time, the goal here is to give the doctor an opportunity to closely examine your bladder wall without causing more damage. Okay, hold on a sec. 
Rachel said, my symptoms improve with D-mannose and vaginal cream. Good. So if they improved with the vaginal cream, that means you were IC subtype 2 bladder wall driven estrogen atrophy. And the D-mannos would have helped reduce any residual bacteria that was struggling in there. Angel said, I experienced all of that, especially sciatic nerve pain. Okay. Then you got tight pelvic floor muscles. Lama said, "Why am I, when I'm sleeping around one or two o'clock, I feel pain in my left side legs, vaginal left side and rectum, pelvic floor area. Then I stand up late night and do some exercise. You got to get your pelvic floor checked and they're going to need to check your SI joint and your hip. They need to check your SI joint and your hip too, honey, on that side. Curtis said, my old urologist retired. I saw a new one here in Dayton, Ohio, who was arrogant, rude, and kept interrupting me. He also told me pelvic muscles have absolutely nothing to do with the bladder. He is full of shit. He obviously has not read the AUA guidelines, which specifically say at the very first appointment, the, the doctor is supposed to do a proper pelvic floor examination. And if muscles are tight, the AUA says that patient should be referred immediately to pelvic floor physical therapy. There are only two recommendations, which is the highest level in the guidelines, one related to Hunter's lesions, one related to pelvic floor. That is a travesty. And I apologize for swearing. <sighs> Sharon says, it's obvious that the herpes patient was by the antiviral and other orthodox supplement of Medicaid. Wait, hold on. Honey, you're not, uh, we're not going to take, we're really not going to take advertisements for other practitioners. Okay. Please don't do that here. And please do not put uh, email addresses or websites in here. Not the place, honey. All right, hold on one sec. Mary says, can you explain why doctors aren't recognizing PCR testing, saying they are showing dead bacteria? My, I, my ID doc, Idaho doc refused to acknowledge despite massive symptoms and no doctor here will do it. Thankfully, Microgen has their own doctors on staff who can help interpret the data for you. Um, you know, I just did a, a pretty big blog and video on this. Um, the ultimate flaw with urine cultures is that they're self-limiting. Culture means grow. They try to grow bacteria. But the way they grow bacteria is with food. It's called a medium. So the problem with the urine culture is it will only identify those bacteria that eat the food they provide. So a urine culture will miss tons. Some would say 90% of the potential bacteria is missed in a typical urine culture. In contrast, PCR testing looks for DNA. And it will identify, and the PCR testing, all they're doing is they're screening for the top 20 or 30 most common pathogens. They're looking for DNA. They're trying to see what they can match to give us a very quick, uh, very quick results. Um, after PCR testing is done, then the next generation DNA urine test is done. And that's where they will give you everything, all the good bacteria, all the bad bacteria and fungal infections, as well as antibiotic resistance genes. So, um, uh, either their health insurance company doesn't want to pay for it or their clinic doesn't want to buy the equipment for it or pay for it, um, or they were trained at a time when PCR testing was considered kind of more loosey-goosey rather than standard of care, standard of testing. Uh, we had at the American Urology Association meeting a couple of years ago, Dr. Curtis Nickel, who's one of the top IC researchers in the world, gave a keynote lecture to the entire body of the AUA, where he just flat out said, this is the future of testing. Next generation DNA testing, PCR testing is far more accurate than a culture. It will find infections that cultures miss. And it's easy. You know, they only required a little bit of, of urine. 
um, there's just a big learning curve. It's new. And of course, the urine culture companies are going to try to discredit it because they don't want a competitor. And, oh, you know, it's just new and it's different, but it's important. Renee says she had the chair cushion we had before, and it is great. I know. It broke my heart when the factory went out of business. Uh, Judy said, because they were custom made for us, and we sold thousands of those a year. Uh, Judy said, I have mild superior end plate compression deformity at T12. Can this affect the pelvic floor? I don't know. I, I, I honestly don't know. Mary says the waffle cushion is great. Anne says, I just got rid of my physical therapist, did not want to do the internal work. You did not want to do the internal work or the therapist did not want to do the internal work. The internal work is the single most important part of physical therapy because they're directly working with the muscles when they do it vaginally or rectally. There was somebody who was saying, yeah, but don't physical therapists normally start externally? and slowly build your trust before they go internal? And the answer is not usually, unless that patient has a history of abuse. If the patient is scared, if the patient has been traumatized, then it, absolutely the physical therapist will not start internally. They will do a lot of external work first, really show you that, that you can trust them. The goal of which is to hopefully get these muscles to release enough so that they can do some internal work. Um, Gosh, I was working with one patient whose muscles were so tight, they could not, the doctor could not insert a speculum and could not insert a finger in her vagina. And that was just so heartbreaking because in her mind, it was so painful when they tried that she's like, you're never touching me down there again, not understanding what was causing that. And not understanding that as long as those muscles stay tight, she was going to be in pain. That tight muscles are not normal. Sex is supposed to be comfortable. Being able to release urine on command is supposed to be easy. Having bowel movements is supposed to be easy. They had never been easy for her because she had suffered trauma when she was very young. I don't remember what the trauma was, but it was, fairly, it was a big deal. And nobody had ever explained to her the long-term toll of having tight muscles until I did. And she went, oh, then maybe I probably need to look at physical therapy again. And I'm like, yeah, you probably should, but you got to tell your physical therapist your history and you got to tell your physical therapist your, your fears, all that sort of stuff. Lamo says here, uh, I have a very, it's very difficult to pee. Yeah, it can be. It can be when your muscles are tight. Hello, Boria. Hello, Margie. Kayleen. Kayleen says, I'm still looking for a doctor to help your clitoral adhesion. Go for it, girl. I want to blame all this depression and physical pain on this crappy weather. You know what, honey? I got to tell you. So let me, I've been a little depressed too. I'm just going to be real honest. And I'm, I usually, usually am really steady. Um, and, and I want your advice if you don't mind, because even support group leaders need support. Um, you know, I've been dealing with my parents' death. This is our first holiday and I've been really good with that getting lots of support for that. And then I have a friend who is inconsolable about the war in Israel and Palestine. Inconsolable. This is somebody who I treasure. This is somebody who has been a very, very good friend of mine over the years, who has become the most angry person I have ever encountered in my life. And I, I keep saying, I don't know what to say to you, except I love you and I care for you. And I, and 
and I, it's horrible what's happened. The problem is that, is that this patient is a yeller. Angel says she's been depressed too. Okay, so this person is a, a yeller and a screamer. And I, I've been saying to some of my other friends for the last month, it's just like, a, oh my God, I've, I've never encountered this level of pure and utter rage and grief. And it has exceeded my ability to cope with it. And now I'm afraid to answer the phone for fear of being yelled at again. I got screamed at on Friday, screamed over the phone. This is not an IC patient, by the way. This is a personal friend. For nothing. I'd done nothing wrong. They had just watched something on TV. They were raging and raging and raging, and they decided to call Jill and let it fly, thinking it was okay to yell at me. It is not okay to take out your anger on other people. And if you're listening to me right now, I accept your apology. Don't ever do it again. I am not at fault for what is happening anywhere. You're angry. And I understand your anger. And I appreciate your anger. And I'm so sorry that you're going through it, but you've got to find a healthy way to get this anger out and not at other people. Because I cried for 36 hours afterwards. Because I can't make it better. And I love this person. They're a dear, dear friend. And it's like they've been hijacked by a rage machine. Does anybody have any tips for me? I mean, I think in my lifetime and in our lifetime, none of us ever thought we would be here. And I'm not saying, I'm not picking sides or anything like that. I'm not picking sides or anything like that. It is heartbreaking. And I think that that's why so many of us are depressed right now. And, they, and the one thing that I can just say to you guys, is that turn off the TV, turn off social networking, turn off social networking, get outside, walk in nature, and be kind to someone. Angel says you have to pray for her. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I'm, I've never had somebody scream at me before. I've never had that happen. And I was just shocked. And I could hear the rage and the grief in her voice. I could hear it. And I'm empathetic to that. But I can't fix that. And we have to take responsibility for our own emotions. The only person who can make us happy is us. We cannot be dependent upon others to change our lives. We have to change our lives. And when you find yourself in a situation like this where you are super, super, super angry, got to get some help for that. And that doesn't mean calling and unloading on your friends because I'm pretty pissed off. I'm sad and I'm pissed off. Angel said, yes, we do. Because you have no, they don't have any right to come into my home. This was over the phone, by the way. And not be respectful of the challenges and stresses and emotional health of the people around us. And I'm fragile right now. I'm grieving right now. And when I tried to stop and, and say, don't do this, it made it even worse. Don't you dare compare the death of your parents with what's happening over there. I'm not. I'm telling you, I'm fragile. It 
it has been quite a moment. Donna says you're doing it right. Sometimes you just have to back away. And that's what, you know, that's what everybody says to me is, is you have to back away. You'll never be able to say the right thing. And I understand that. I never tried. I mean, they call me. I don't call them. But there are times when for our own self self-preservation, we have to back away. So I can't be living in this zone here. <clears throat> I can't be living in that. You know what I mean? Donna says exactly. So any wisdoms you might have to share? I mean, I've been talking to religious experts. I've been talking to other people. I've been talking just like, what do I do? What do I do? I don't know what to do. And I'm re normally really good with people in pain. <coughs> Sorry, that's my right tonsil. And I'm stymied. All right, let's get back to your questions. Christina says, okay, here, hold on. Carolyn says, urologist found absolutely nothing wrong with my bladder. Exactly. So that's good news. Let's celebrate that for the good news that it is. They found nothing wrong with your bladder. Now we have to look beyond your bladder at your muscles and your nerves, maybe some estrogen atrophy, stuff like that. They have nothing wrong with my bladder too. And yet I had terrible urinary symptoms for years not having a clue that it was my muscles and nerves from the age of 14 to the age of 50. All that wasted time doing bladder treatments never worked. What worked and got me symptom-free was physical therapy. Christina says, I'm seeing a pelvic floor physical therapist three months now, progressing, but still not great. Good days, bad days. My question though is, you often say, pain on fill points to the bladder wall, but with pelvic floor tightness, could you also have pain on bladder fill? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because of ischemia. Your muscles are so tight, they're restricting blood flow to the bladder. That's what ischemia means. Tissues are suffering because they don't have a good supply of oxygen and nutrition. The bladder wall breaks down. I was very diet sensitive for many years. I'm not diet sensitive now. You know what I'm drinking right now, guys? Hot lemonade. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? I didn't have lemonade for 29 years until I got COVID. And when I was coughing so badly, I'm like, I think hot lemonade with honey is the thing. And I was shocked it didn't flare me. Living proof, living proof that when we get blood supply restored, the muscles relaxed, the bladder gets the blood supply it needs to heal. Curtis said he didn't know he didn't like me questioning. He he also didn't know what high pressure, low pressure meant. He said cystoscopy is done by hanging an IV bag, and there's no such thing as high or low pressure. Well, Curtis, I think what we need to do is print out the AUA guidelines uh, and bring that into him so that he can read those guidelines because they describe in depth how it should be done, the height of the bag, is it low, is it high, the quantity of fluid, et cetera. So the AUA guidelines will do that. Carolyn, he says, my bladder's healthy, what now? We're gonna look at muscles and nerves now. Renee said, I asked for that test, there was three bacteria and a fossa mice and cleared it. Okay, cool. Mary says, I know PCR looks at DNA, but if it picks up dead bacteria, then how would we know? I'm in Canada, so we don't even have it. And docs here have never heard of it. Well, maybe heard it, but not accepting it. Well, again, Dr. Curtis Nickel, the top IC doctor in Canada, is the one who gave that lecture. And we've got good research from Canada with next generation DNA and PCR testing, as well as the new UTI vaccines that are coming out. <sighs> You know, in the end, you have to understand that 
our body is dependent on bacteria. We have an, millions of good bacteria in our body. And we have pathogenic bad bacteria in our body. And it's basically biological warfare. You always want more of the pathogenic to keep the bad bacteria under check. So how does that balance get disrupted? Uh, with food habits, um, with antibiotic use, et cetera, et cetera. There are moments when the pathogenic bacteria have, uh, you know, are, are in the majority and they kill the good bacteria. And so it's really a, an ecosystem of good versus bad, healthy versus pathogenic. We are learning now, we're trying to learn more about what good bacteria do. For example, there's one bacteria that one research study on the biome, on the IC biome, found that we were deficient of, but it was an intestinal bacteria. And it was a bacteria that provides food to the lining, to the cells lining the bowel. Some of the things that bacteria do for us, the human body cannot do on its own. This bacteria fill important roles in keeping us alive and well and healthy. So are we going to have dead bacteria in our urine? Yes. Are we gonna have dead bacteria in our bowel movements? Absolutely. But it's meaningful to find it because if they find a massive overabundance of E. coli DNA, which can be quite pathogenic, then that provides insight into what could be happening with your lower urinary tract symptoms. It's data. It's data. It's useful information. That's how I look at it. That's why I believe in it. And there is no doubt that PCR next generation testing have found pathogenic infections that are very, very difficult to culture. And there is no doubt that PCR and next generation testing has saved lives. One of the areas where it's really, really good is for patients who have deep infections after joint replacements. If you've ever had a hip replaced or anything at all like that, you know, they don't want you to have any dental work for like six months beforehand. We got to make sure that as much of the pathogenic bacteria as possible is way, way down because it's, it can be quite devastating to get an infection in a bone or in an artificial joint replacement. And on some of these infections are brutal um, and they're difficult. And these, this next generation testing can identify those infections and potentially save that life. It is what infectious disease doctors are using regularly now. Curtis says, you didn't like me questioning him. Oh, sorry, we got that one already. Uh, Lama says, how can I make my muscle relax? Well, stretching. Um, doing, you know, the problem with a tight muscle is it's like this, and we've got to get it to release, release, and flatten. You know, when you pop a when you pop a bicep, you get a big lump right here when you pop your bicep, right? That's a tight muscle. Normally. Muscles are long and loose and pliant. A tight muscle is hard. A healthy, relaxed muscle feels like a raw chicken breast. It's got substance, but it's pliant. A tight muscle feels like beef jerky that's painful. So sometimes if it's locked tight, you can't release it on your own. It's going to take a finger in your vagina working it, 
working it to try to get it to relief. Muscle memory is challenging. Muscles kind of remember, muscles get stuck. And sometimes muscles think they're supposed to be tight even when they're supposed to be relaxed. And that can just be from having a bad joint or having a limp or something like that. Kristen said, I have the same issue. I have pain on bladder fill, pain on release, physical therapy, it's helping, but it's slow. I think I also have bladder wall driven and estrogen atrophy subtypes. Listen, if you're over the age of 40, yeah, you got to pay attention to the quality and health of your skin because as estrogen levels diminish, your bladder wall is going to get more sensitive and vulnerable. That's a separate and distinct issue, but it's going to influence your bladder, no doubt about it. Denise says, what do I think about the possibility of the E. coli vaccine? I think it's fantastic. I just did an article on it in our last IC Optimist magazine, our Summer Optimist. It's, the data is fantastic. They are using it in many countries now. Uh, hundred, I think a couple hundred thousand patients have used it. Safety profile looks very good. It's just not available in the United States, and I hope it gets here soon. Kayleen said, my physical therapist won't do rectal work either because of my sexual abuse trauma. I believe the Fourchette massage helps in some way. It can. You know, I mean, yeah, you guys, you know that I use my body as an educational tool. <laughs> I literally will talk about anything without any embarrassment at all. So um, I have moments where I had a lot of moments years ago where I had a lot of rectal pain. And it was, um, um, it felt like glass in my rectum. Um, it was really uncomfortable. And I went to an IBS specialist to really help me. And part of the problem for me was that my, my bowel movements were very hard. It was like passing rocks. And she, I, got the, I got the fiber lecture. Jill, how many, fiber, how many grams of fiber do you eat a day? I went, I have no idea. Nobody's ever asked me that question. But I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> and she laughed and goes, well, did you know that you need to eat at least 20 grams of fiber a day to have a normal bowel movement? I was like, oh, no. <laughs> and she said, I doubled our dare you. Go home. Count it up, see where you are. I was eating six grams of fiber on a good day, six. And once I improved my fiber intake, things improved dramatically. But now if I get rectal pain, it's always my muscles, always. And I realize that it's not really rectal pain, it's pain in the muscles right next to the rectum. And so if I'm feeling a little uncomfortable down there, uh, I basically slide my, my hand down my butt cheek and I just, I don't go all the way to my rectum. I'm just touching the muscle that goes from the tailbone to the um, SI bone. I mean, not the SI bone, the sit bone. And it's always tight. It's always tender to touch. So how do I treat that rectal pain now is with a little bit of external massage. I just, you know, get in there. But I'm not touching my rectum at all. I'm just working the muscle through the skin around in each butt cheek, kind of uh, on the sides of the glute. I hope that makes sense. Uh, Diane says, I'm having some relief from my pain on bladder fill from weekly installations. I also use estrogen cream. I take Systomend and avoid acidic and spidey foods. I don't like the pain I have when they insert the catheter. They used a French 10 or 12 the last time and it was better than 14. That's right, because it's smaller. I've asked about using pediatric catheter, but my Euro nurses say they don't have that. I have a bit of damage to my urethra. You got three more and still scheduled. For Diane, that a pediatric catheter is really going to be an eight, like an eight to a 10. 
So just ask them to use the 10. I was a little bit better. Make sure that they are numbing your urethra. Make sure they're doing a low friction catheter, which is basically wet on the outside. It's slimy. So it slides in easy and it's easy to pull out and it's not as traumatic. So using a low frick catheter. Mary said, let's see, Diane says, rage can be a sign of depression. Can she see a therapist? Yes, manage how much and what you watch. Because news is about ratings and getting people worked up. G girl, you got that right. I'm, I'm turning in Comcast this week. I'm done. I am done. I'm sick of it. To realize that all these media companies, uh, uh, the way they make money with advertisers is to keep us upset. If they tell happy stories, people don't watch. If they generate conflict, they're more engaged. I'm done. Comcast is going. My cable service is going. I'm sick of it. I'm going to be a Netflix girl and an Acorn girl and a BritBox girl from this point forward. I mean, we're just really, I just said it to somebody the other day. It's like, at times like this, it's almost as if social, social media has to be shut down. It's just so harmful to so many people. It's really heartbreaking what's happening right now. Diane says she can use the energy from her anger to send supplies to people who are already doing that. Under anger is usually more vulnerable feelings that she has to ex explore professionally. I agree. Gay says, pray for her. Carolyn said, have pelvic floor therapy. Only said, weak vaginal wall. Okay. So if you have a weak vaginal wall, then uh, what are we going to do about that? Uh, Marlia said, same situation. My friend has frustrating in their workplace and will call me and unload and then becomes angered at my words of consoling to try and help, then becomes so angry about what he's going through and hangs up on. Exactly, Marlia, exactly, exactly. I love my friend and I'm in a horrible depression because I don't want to end our relationship, friendship. The sadness is overwhelming. You are doing the right thing. I can't bring myself to cut this relationship off. I can't cut my relationship off too, but I'm going to distance. Marlia, you nailed it. You're going through exactly what I'm going through, and it is very complicated. Deborah says, she's listening from Louisiana. I have always wanted to visit Louisiana. One day I will. Keep up the good work. Thank you, honey. Uh, Mary says, very strange because docs in Canada don't accept it. Did, did Dr. Nickel tell docs here? Yeah, he was the chairman of the Canadian Urology Association a couple years ago for a year. You know, the problem with Canada and England, you got the thing you got to understand about Canada and, and the United Kingdom is that it's a very different medical system, medical care system. And because I know I flew to England with Dr. Stoller years and years ago to talk about um, the ankle stimulation. And so we were on the BBC and on some TV shows and stuff like that. Um, um, the way they explained it to me is that it's a very patriarchal medical system where literally there's like two or three doctors at the very top that control everything. And if that doctor at the top doesn't believe in next-gen testing, then the medical system will not do it. It's a very patriarchal, top-down medical belief system. And so that's very true in Canada, and that is very, very true in England. Um, by the way, by the way, by the way, for anybody listening in the United Kingdom, um, I finally got our book, I see, I see 101 in a Amazon UK Kindle store, and I'm looking for reviews. Um, and I would love to find five or 10 patients from the United Kingdom that I can send our book to for free so that you can do a review on Amazon. Uh, so if you're out there listening from the United Kingdom, uh, would you please email me, icnetwork at mac.com, icnetwork at mac.com. And I would love to send you a book.
no charge. Um, also, you guys know we've had terrible, terrible problems trying to ship stuff internationally now. Um, it's almost impossible at this point in time to, right now we're shipping to United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, we were shipping to Israel, but there's a lot of mail theft in Israel. So we, we did have to shut that down. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm creating separate pages, uh, uh, to your various Amazon stores. So Amazon UK, Amazon EU, where I'm going to give you the closest that I can find to the products that we have that you can buy in your store. I mean, in your country, because we just can't, we can't ship it. We just, especially supplements, we cannot ship them. So I'm really working hard to try to come up, come up with a workaround. Um, Cause right now we can't even do memberships to these countries right now. Um, and we've got our programmers working on it. It's a very, very dicey situation. So again, for those of you from the United Kingdom, I already have your Amazon page built. I just haven't published it anywhere yet, but I have a bunch of products that are very similar to the products that we sell that might be helpful. And they have Dandy Blend, for example, in the United Kingdom, which was exciting, our herbal coffee but also finding supplements that are very close to bladder builder and bladder rest and stuff. Mary said, my infectious disease doc was the one that discounted the PCR test. Well, they do discount the PCR test because it's not as good as the next generation test. It's a quickie test. It only looks for 20 to 30 of the more common bacteria. Uh, common bacteria. It's not the end, the end run best DNA test. Kayla says, I think you mentioned this before, but I bought a microgen test, but I've been taking Desert Harvest Aloe Vera and Euro MP. Is there a time frame to be off of these meds before doing and submitting the test? Um, I have to familiarize myself with the Euro MP. Is that the um, methylene blue, the new version of methylene blue? I think it is. Um, yeah, it's a high, yeah, it is. It's the hyosamine, methenamine, and methylene blue. Okay. So Euro MP, M is in Mary, P is in Paul, um, acts as a mild antiseptic that can fight bacteria in the urine and bladder. The salicylate in it is a mild pain reliever in it. And it has a kind of smooth muscle relaxing effect. The challenge is that Doctors who suggest this are operating on the assumption that you have underneath it all a bacterial infection. And it's really not particularly useful um, for, say, uh, chemocystitis. It might help reduce some of the symptoms, but it's not going to fix anything because you do have to remember that for most of us, we don't have a pathogenic bacteria. It's, it's a small population of patients who might. So Euro, uh, Denise says, your MP made me sick. Urologist prescribed it, not a fan. Yeah. So um. I am so not the person to ask this question to. I think you need to call Microgen and ask them that question. I don't see the, al I, is, is aloe antibacterial? Um, hold on. I think I, it does have mild antibacterial effects. because of poly polyphenols, it may inhibit the growth of certain bac bacteria that can cause infections. 
So it, ha it, might, it has a bit of a mild antibacterial, mild antiviral and antiseptic. But of course we don't know the form of aloe that is used. Um, it looks like it, it might be more effective with staphylococcus, maybe not with E. coli. So I think you have to call a company. I don't know. I, I'm not an aloe fan so much. Um, you know, for me, it's all about cause and effect. Cause and effect. The symptoms are the effect. We want to try to find what's driving those symptoms. If it's estrogen atrophy, we got to work on the skin with some topical estrogen. If it's tight pelvic floor muscles, we've got to work on those muscles to get them to relax and relieve. Um, if it's pelvic congestion syndrome, we got to work on the blood vessels. If it's a bad joint, we got to work on the bad joint. Aloe can be soothing during a flare, but the bladder is not made of aloe, and I don't see it having a constructive effect. I, I see it having, having more of a temporary effect especially if you're flaring. But when we're thinking about focusing on underlying causation, I, I just it was I just don't look at it the same way anymore. Um, we sell and listen guys, the IC Networks has sold aloe for years because it was all we had for years. But but now we have other products like bladder builder and bladder rest that I think um, make a bit more sense with respect to uh, get providing a real coating effect for the bladder and an antihistaminic effect for the bladder, and, et cetera. Um, so the aloe that we have now is allopath. And that's a combination of aloe and PEA. And so the aloe can be soothing during the flare. The PEA is a proven track record of calming nerves down. So it's just enhancing that soothing effect. So I, I, I'm liking allopath more now, especially for patients who might be flaring with a bladder wall flare. Uh, Denise said, you have the Millie wand, you were gonna tell us. Okay, um, which one? Uh, hold on, I think it's in here. Was it this one? So this was a sample I received. Um, as a wand that actually um, can have some heat to it and heat's good because it can relax muscle but it will also get bigger. So it kind of acts, so you can see it's, it just lit up there. I don't know if you can see that light there. It will actually increase in size. Can you see that? See how it's getting bigger? So um, I really like this. Um, The cost was over $300. And I, it's just, as I said to them, I said, you got to know your market here. Um, I, I don't know any patient who's going to spend $300 on a wand. And so um, I encourage them to consider their pricing strategy. So I was very, very disappointed. I mean, I got, I was very, really excited to actually get the wand and to, to work with the wand. I was shocked at the price. So you can still get it, but it's gonna be in the upper 300s to buy.
Mary said, sorry, wrong wording. It was pathnostic, so I believe that's DNA. They say it picks up dead DNA. I don't know. I don't know reality. I don't know reality. Can't get a doc to believe me here. I don't understand how Dr. Nickel is from here, and we can't get the docs here to help. That's Canada, hun. That's why a lot of Canadian patients come to the U.S. If you're in, um, um, uh, oh, come on, I'm zoning on the province, King Ontario, you can just come right down to right down to Detroit and see one of the best doctors in the world, Dr. Ken Peters. So a lot of our Canadian customers come to the U.S. They do. Carolyn said she developed an itchy rash two days after a hydrodistension with cystoscopy. Can it be from the dye? They don't use a dye when they do a hydrodistension with cystoscopy. It sounds like you had an IVP or avoiding cystogram. Those tests, they do a dye. A hydrodistension, they don't you normally do a dye. Um, Alina says, hello, Alina. I'm newly diagnosed with IC after a mid-urethral sling surgery seven weeks ago. I live in Southern California, and I believe so are you. Actually, I'm up here in Northern California, north of San Francisco. Do you know of any good specialist that you can recommend? My mind seems like she's giving up on me. Well, so, okay. How do I want to answer this question? Oh, this is, this is always such a hard question to answer. Um, it's getting a little bit hard to find pelvic pain specialists. And so what we tend to do is we tend to break it out into sections. So if you're having a muscle issue, then we're going to go to a physical therapist. We've got fabulous pelvic physical therapists in Southern California, many of them. If you have Hunter's lesions, then we need to get to a urologist. If you have estrogen atrophy, we need to get to a gynecologist. If you have uh, signs of pelvic congestion syndrome, then we need to get you to an interventional radiologist. Our challenge here is that we don't have specialists who will do all that in one setting, except for Dr. Robert Eckenberg in Pennsylvania. He will. Um, and I just had a fabulous chat with uh, Dr. Christopher Payne, who was our IC specialist here on the West Coast for many, many years. He was out of Stanford. He directed their female urology division. Um, uh, he He's retired now, uh, but he's just decided he's going to see patients one day a week in San Luis Obispo because he retired down to San Luis Obispo. So we do have Dr. Christopher Payne back in practice one day a week. And that was his question to me is, Jill, is there anybody who's rising to the forefront? And the answer is no. And that's why he's continuing to see patients. Um, so he's a lovely guy. He's adorable. He's a sweet, nice man. Um, so you've got one option with them. But what I would suggest that you do first, Alina, is let's just see if we can phenotype you first. I don't know if you've heard the term phenotyping before. Um, here's the deal. A diagnosis of IC is fairly meaningless. It means you have frequency, urgency, bladder pain, or pelvic pain, and they don't know why. So you've now been given this, hey, you've got this incurable bladder disease diagnosis. But we don't think of IC as a bladder disease anymore, and that's what our national guidelines say. It's very rare that you actually find any disease in the bladder of most patients. IC is considered more of a neuromuscular condition. And the fact that you had sling surgery tells me that your muscles are messed up. Um, and so muscles can, so, so, there's tremendous diversity in the IC patient population. For some people, it begins in childhood. For others, it begins after menopause. You have the same diagnosis, but are you the same? No. For some people, IC begins while going through chemotherapy because the chemicals of the chemo damage their bladder. While for others, IC begins when they fall and break their tailbone. They have the same diagnosis, but are they the same? No. And we really see that diversity when we look in the bladder because 
most of us have a completely normal bladder wall. But a small percentage of patients do have bleeding ulcers on their bladder or bleeding lesions on their bladder. They have the same diagnosis, but are they biologically the same? No, we're not. Tremendous diversity in this patient population. So what we've been doing for the last five to seven years, beginning with Dr. Christopher Payne, he was the first doctor who called it. He said, we need to, we need to go below a diagnosis of IC and get to underlying causation. And we do that with phenotyping. We do that by recognizing there are distinct groups in the IC patient population. They each have very different treatment, treatment goals. So Dr. Payne believes that there are, are five. We've used this system for seven, eight years now, and it's fabulous. So Hunter's lesion is one group. So these are patients with very, very severe symptoms. They've got open wounds on their bladder. They've got a lot of blood in their urine. They're very, very diet limited. And that represents about 5 to 10% of the patient population. Hunter's lesions have now been linked to viral infections. And in some cases, nerves that are very, very irritated. So now we know why patients with Hunter's lesions didn't respond to most bladder treatments, because it's a virus. And the virus is the Epstein-Barr virus from mononucleosis or the polyoma virus. Uh, sometimes HPV, sometimes herpes, but mostly Epstein-Barr and polyoma. Our second subtype or phenotype is bladder wall driven, where there's an identifiable issue with the bladder wall. So the first thing we're going to look for is chemocystitis, a chemical injury, because the bladder, like any other part of the body, can be injured, and they're injured through chemical exposure. So these are the patients whose symptoms begin during chemotherapy. These are the patients whose symptoms begin because they have an absolutely terrible diet and they drink way too much diet soda, green tea, or coffee. You got to remember our bladder was, was created thousands, millions of years ago before the advent of all this strong acid. And our bladder is not designed to tolerate acid washes every day over decades. It's just not. And that acid, those irritants, will eventually erode the bladder wall and cause problems. So we're going to look for a chemical injury of the bladder. The second mini group that we're going to look at is estrogen atrophy. Because it turns out, I mean, think about your bladder for a moment. It's the only organ in the human body designed to hold toxic waste. So how can the bladder hold ammonia for hours at a time and not get damaged? Well. It turns out that it's really quite an evolutionary marvel that your bladder is wet on the inside. It has a really thick, robust coating of mucus. It's like your mouth. Oh, wait a second. Ah! <laughs> it's vibrating. <laughs> you hear those stories of people who um, they're going through. Um, airline airline checklists and their luggage starts to vibrate <laughs> that was hysterical it was vibrating okay it's off now okay getting back to estrogen atrophy okay so your bladder wall defends itself with a really thick robust coating of mucus we call it the glycosaminoglycan layer or the mucosal barrier it's a barrier. It protects things. It's thick. So when you have this barrier, urine stays away from the more fragile cells of your bladder wall. So mucus is good. Unfortunately, it is estrogen dependent. So when you're young and have lots of estrogen, you got lots of mucus and you might be able to handle all that coffee. But guess what? If you're on strong birth control, if you're on Lupron for endometriosis, if you've had a hysterectomy, or you're just getting older, you don't have the estrogen, which means you don't have the mucus, which means your bladder's ability to defend itself is now compromised. That's not a disease. We call that estrogen atrophy or the genitourinary syndrome of menopause. What's our treatment for this group? Our treatment for this group is estrogen. Because when you give that skin estrogen, it plumps up and it starts to produce mucus again. 
So we women have to pay attention to the quality and health of our skin. If your vulva is dry and your vagina is dry, then so is your urethra, so is your bladder. And yes, it's going to feel like a UTI, but it's not UTI. It's simply irritation due to something in your urine that is getting through to the nerves of your bladder wall because you don't have the mucus anymore. I can talk more about that later. The third thing we're going to look at is, is there any chance this patient has a funky infection, a difficult to culture infection? And this is where next generation DNA urine testing is really good because it will identify urea plasma, really weird, difficult to diagnose infections. I was working with a patient a couple of weeks ago. You're not going to believe what they found in her bladder. It was shocking. Black mold. She had black mold fungus growing in her bladder. And that's not the first time. Actually, bladder, infe bladder symptoms are a common side effect of people who are exposed to black mold. So that next generation test can look for the weird, random, funky infection that your regular doctors might have missed, which is why I'm a big fan of it. If you're interested in learning more about next generation testing, I have a website, bladderhealth.org, bladderhealth.org. Go on over and check that out. We have a lot of videos. I uh, also just did a big video on it in our the uh, on our YouTube channel. We have a new video on it, um, and a big did a big blog and article on it. I mean, it has a place. It has a place in the IC world, especially for patients who are not responding to therapy. What could we have missed? So let's go on to our third subtype or phenotype. Our third phenotype is pelvic floor driven. These are the patients whose symptoms began after a muscle trauma, falling falling down the stairs, falling off of a horse, riding a bicycle too long, being injured during a childbirth, scoliosis, anything that tweaks the pelvic floor. This is by far our biggest subtype with 80 to 85% of patients having tight pelvic floor muscles. And unfortunately, there's a toll to be taken with tight pelvic floor muscles because they start restricting blood to the bladder you develop something called ischemia. And if the bladder is supposed to get 24 units of blood a day and it's only getting 10, are you going to have a healthy bladder wall? Mm -mm. But for these patients, of course, you really have no idea you have a muscle injury and you do all the bladder treatments. You do everything, but you don't get better. You still flare. Why? Because they miss the most important thing, which is poor blood supply from, uh, from tight muscles. So our therapeutic priority for this group is to restore blood supply with physical therapy to get these muscles to release. Phenotype number four is pudendal neuralgia. These are patients who have positional symptoms are fine when they stand, but when they sit down, it hurts, or when they bend over, it hurts. If movement causes symptoms, you have more symptoms when you walk, when you bend over, when you sit down. And, and it gets better when you stand up. That means you have muscles so tight, they're squeezing nerves. So you might have sciatica, you might have areas of numbness, pins and needles, or persistent genital arousal disorder where you feel this incredibly disgusting and awful arousal sensation that is stunningly painful. And that just means that your muscles are squeezing your pudendal nerve. So therapeutically for these patients, we want to try to identify the nerve, maybe with some nerve blocks, and we got to release those muscles with physical therapy. So they're going to identify the nerve. They're going to try to figure out where it's compromised, going to have physical therapy to calm the muscles down. And they might have some treatments to calm the nerves down, like Peora, Gabapentin, maybe a topical uh, lidocaine cream along the skin, anything that will help us get these screaming nerves to calm down. And last but not least, widespread pain is also a really significant subtype. These are patients who have IC, IBS, vulvodynia, TMJ, fibromyalgia. If you have two or more, your diagnosis is chronic overlapping pain conditions. This is one of my subtypes. I'm pelvic floor, widespread pain. This is essentially a nervous system injury. It's an injury to the central nervous system. And therapeutically, what we have to do is calm these nerves down. The research with chronic overlapping pain 
finds a, a brain living in a constant state of fight or flight from that physical injury or from a history of abuse or bullying. And so therapeutically, we have got to get the brain out of fight or flight because that keeps the nerves amped up. We got to calm everything down. And so for this group of patients, we're going to be doing a lot more mind-body medicine, really focusing on that anxiety, trying to get, listen, I had terrible anxiety in my 20s and, and early 30s. Terrible anxiety. We're talking panic attacks, going to doctors, panic attacks at, at airports. And I did not understand the totality of how everything related to each other. My case, I was a victim of uh, really um, uh, severe trauma when I was young. Um, not from my family, but I grew up in a neighborhood with a rapist and murderer, and I was one of his earliest victims. In the year I went away to college, he raped and murdered my neighbor. So I did not leave my home without fear from fourth grade through high school. You want to talk fight or flight? I was in fight or flight every day for hours and hours and hours. And I did not understand the toll that that takes on your body, that it raises your heart rate, it raises your blood pressure, it tightens your muscles, and nerves become much more sensitive. And that's the connection between all of these pain conditions. So I took an anxiety management class, and when I was 35, completely changed my life. And that was the start of me getting better because that was when I was able to get my brain calmed down, my central nervous calmed down. And I just have to really reinforce here, nobody's saying this is mental illness in any way, shape, or form. We call this a central nervous system maladaption. It's an injury to the nervous system. And for 80% of the kids it happens to, it's from a physical injury. 14 days of pain will put the brain into a constant state of fight or flight. And then for the other 20%, it's a history of abuse or bullying. And, you know, there was an actor. Um, do you guys remember the kid that was in that Tom Cruise movie about the really cute blonde haired kid with a really big smile? Um, I forget his name. And he became very, very famous in this Tom Cruise movie. He was like in elementary school at the time. And when he went back to school, he was bullied terribly, terribly throughout his young years. And he ended up developing very, very severe anxiety. And uh, I just watched an interview of him um, in the last week or so. Um, and it was so interesting comparing his experience with my experience, how it affected his body, how it affected my body. And they were almost identical, um, except his was more severe than mine, which I think is really quite amazing because mine, I thought, was very, very severe. His, his was, I mean, there is a toll to be had with bullying and abuse. It's just what it is. So getting back to Alina here, if we phenotype you and try to I prioritize what could be going on, that'll help us find a, a doctor to care for you. The fact that you had mid-urethral sling therapy surgery points me to muscles directly. And um, uh, there's a website, pelvicrehab.com, pelvicrehab.com. You can search by zip code. There are a ton of physical therapists down in Southern California that are very, very good. You're also welcome to give me a phone call. I'm happy to point you in the direction and give you some names through that database. It just has to be somebody trained properly in pelvic floor work. <sighs> Diane, are bladder installations a good treatment for a sensitive bladder wall due to estrogen atrophy? In addition to estrogen cream, of course, I'm, I'm doing um, here. I'm doing the series of six installations with heparin, Kenalog, and lidocaine will improve the gag. Um, sure, 
Sure. You know, because one of the things that kind of happens is the nerve, you know, if you don't have a nice thick coating, urine is now getting where it's not supposed to be. It's getting down into those cells, tweaking those cells, causing mast cells to release histamine and irritating the heck out of nerves. And so the theory behind a rescue installation is we've got heparin in there to coat the bladder combined with lidocaine to calm the nerves down. The challenge is that nerves are um, remarkably stubborn. And sometimes you just have to keep turning them off. And the goal here is every time you turn them off, even for a couple of hours, they calm down. Then they get irritated again. You turn them off again. And, and so with the rescue instill, the protocol, well, there are a bunch of different protocols. Um, three times a week for two weeks and then once a week for four weeks uh, or once a week for eight weeks. Um, and you can find all of those formulas over on the IC Network website and in our bladder installation area taken straight from the research study. So I don't have a problem with you doing the bladder instills at all. If you're struggling with a really severe flare, they call it a rescue for a reason. It will rescue you out of a flare. You will have a couple of hours or more of relief. And sometimes that's important, if not just for your emotional health, just to give you a break from the pain, but also to prove to you that the pain can't be turned off. You know, sometimes you get lost in the pain and you're just like, it'll never go away. It'll never go away. I mean, that's how I was my first year. Of course, I had no pain care my first year. And I ended up in the hospital up in South, South Lake Tahoe after a ridiculously stupid decision to get on a, on a tr train in the middle of a flare. You know, think about the effect of a, a, of a train ride on my tight pelvic floor muscles. Oh, my God. Horrible mistake on my part. Um, and uh, they gave me a, a, a shot of pain and a pain meds, Toradol, I think, went away. And I was like, you mean you can turn this off after a year of suffering? And I suffered. Um, and, I would, and I'm a pharmacologist. That's my training. It never even dawned on me to even consider pain meds for a bladder issue. And, um, and it was so good for my morale to see that there was light at the end of the tunnel, that if we silenced the nerves, my pain would go away. And, and I needed to know that. That was revolutionary for me. Of course, our challenge here is that um, pain meds are hard to come by these days because of the opiate crisis. Um, so we're very lucky that we have palmitoyl ethanolamide Peora, the supplement Peora, but there's lots of PEA sub, uh, supplements out there that have a proven track record of calming nerve pain down. And that's what I take now, uh, just to keep my nerves kind of calm and copacetic. So I hope that answered your question. Can you tell I can just talk? <laughs> I can just talk about it. Okay. Uh, Mary said, Dr. Peters charges $600 just for the first appointment. Unfortunately, that's not possible for most. Plus treatment would be astronomical, I'm sure. I believe I've got a UTI recurring. Mary, listen, honey. I can't tell you the number of patients who call me who believe that. They're just like, I am 100% sure I have an infection because, of course, everything feels like infection in the bladder. Your bladder only has two sets of nerves. You've got your alpha afferent nerve, which con control frequency urgency, and you've got the C fiber, which controls pain. So everything feels like a UTI. A bullet wound would feel like a UTI. A stab wound would feel like a UTI. 
cancer would feel like a UTI. The only way that the bladder can communicate and tell you there's a problem is big by giving you the symptoms that you associate with the UTI. So, um, you know, I just filmed a video on this, a patient that I was working with who was just like, Jill, I'm sure I have a UTI, but her urine cultures were negative. Her bladder wall was perfectly healthy. No sign of a disease in her bladder wall at all. But she did have tight pelvic floor muscles, but she wanted antibiotics, 100%. She refused all other therapies. I'm not going to physical therapy. I want antibiotics. You're all wrong. And she was driving her doctor kind of crazy. And she was, she was not, she didn't understand the anatomy. So she called me and said, Jill, I'm sure I have an infection. And I went, well, your bladder wall's healthy, your cultures are coming back negative, and you do have tight pelvic floor muscles, so maybe, just maybe, that's where you need to be working. At least give it a try. And she got really mad at me and said, no, it's an infection, you're wrong. And I thought, okay, prove it. How can you prove it? Next generation DNA urine test. Costs you 250 bucks. And that will be the penultimate way to determine if you have an active infection or not. Otherwise, you're just guessing. And the last thing we want to do is take antibiotics if there's no infection, because that causes more damage. So I said to her, I said, have an X-Gen test. And if that comes back, showing you've got a rare and unusual infection, you've got all the ammunition you need to request the antibiotics. But if that next generation test comes back negative, then that's proof that you don't have infection. And it's time to walk away from that theory and focus instead on your muscles. I have this conversation all the time with patients. And it's so confusing because it feels like an infection. You are 100% convinced it is an infection. I can't tell you the number of urine cultures I had over the years. And even my first year diagnosed with IC, I probably had 20 cultures. They were all negative. And on cysto, I had a normal bladder. But back then we didn't know about the muscles. Now we know about the muscles. And of course, for me, healthy bladder wall. It's always been my muscles and my nerves. Lori Chavez says, Dr. Gabal in Santa Ana is a pelvic pain specialist. Dr. Lawrence Lynn in, is an IC specialist in Newbury Park. Lori, thank you for sharing. Excellent. Peggy said, I'm on my second installation of heparin and lidocaine. My first one lasted five hours. Yes. And I was pain-free. I'm optimistic that it will calm my bladder down. Excellent. Go for it. Mary says, but I do have a recent pathnostics that says I do have infection. What, what's the infection, Mary? What's the infection? What's the bacteria? Gina said, I just started watching your videos. You really know your stuff. You explain it so well. I finally got some manners. Excellent. Thank you, Gina. You know, believe it or not, I've been, you know, I've been a support group leader for 30 years and this is my job. I, you know, I, the IC network is a health education company. Uh, we, um, we facilitate the largest IC support group in the world. We've got tens of thousands of uh, uh, patients who follow our work. And we've also been rated number one in the world by Harvard Medical School Children's Hospital and the uh, University of London. So I study IC virtually every single day. And I do, we do a lot of research. Uh, my training is in pharmacology, drug development, but I also have a master's degree in psychology. 
and the IC network was my doctoral dissertation proposal uh, for how to bring support to patients who were homebound, which ironically I could not do because it was too painful to drive to school. But 30 years later, we're still, my little student project is rated the best in the world. So always working on it, let me tell you. Uh, Ann says, does Medicare cover next generation tests? Yes, it does. It does. Uh, Carolyn says, will PEA help with the urgency frequency? It could calm the nerve down that's triggering the frequency urgency. In 2019, we had our first PEA IC study uh, that was presented at the American Urology Association annual meeting. Um, and the doctors were very, very excited because by month three, 87% of IC patients reported a significant reduction in their symptoms and pain. Um, the, and they were very, very excited that they could suggest something for pain that was not an opiate, that did not come with all the baggage of opiates. Um, so I took that research study to a company that I've worked with, Natural Approach Nutrition, and said, hey, here's a study from Europe. Can you give us a formula similar to it for the United States? And that is Piora. And let me see. Yeah, it is right here. Piora. And the cool thing is that it's um, very inexpensive. It's like under $30 compared to some of the other supplements. So for me, um, it's what I take because redhead, it's very, very sensitive nerves. I have very, very sensitive skin. And menopause kicked my ass when it came to skin sensitivity. And I had a lot of pinpricks trying to sleep. Um, and some nights I couldn't sleep because my skin was so irritated. And I don't, you know, listen, my opinion is not for sale. And I've had a lot of companies try to get me to, you know, try our supplement, be our spokesperson. And I'm like, no, I don't do that. Uh, I've never done that in 30 years. Um, but I couldn't sleep. My skin was so bad. I just felt like I was being poked by needles all the time. I just thought, you know what? I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it. I got nothing to lose. I want to be able to sleep. And my skin sensitivity is virtually gone. I might have one pinprick every two days, one, instead of 100 a night. So PEA for me personally has been very, very life-changing. And I love this stuff. Um, and the safety profile there many, many, many research studies, no side effects in the vast majority of studies. It is a simple endocannabinoid. Um, and it's, we've got the IC study that shows that it's helpful, but we got studies with fibromyalgia, studies with TMJ, studies with burning mouth syndrome, studies with surgical pain, acute pain, chronic pain, and PEA has been found helpful for all of those. It's pretty new. I mean, it's been in Europe for about 20 years, but here in the U.S. it's pretty new to us, but it's very, very exciting. You guys are pretty quiet over on YouTube. Are you okay? Uh, Marlia says, I have a very puffy sensation down there, like when your thighs rub together, it feels like my lady bits rub, your dryness is horrible. Sjogren, some fibro, 73, I'm limping from a bad knee and ankle. Hello, I'm a mess. I rub estradiol on that area, only on the outside. It sometimes gives me a backache the next day. I'm afraid, afraid to insert it inside. Well, Marlia, the skin on the outside, I mean, we have to be specific. So I don't know if I really understand where you're putting it. Um, the estrogen relates to mucous membrane skin, skin that's wet. So that is the inside of your vulva, your labia, especially the inner lips of your labia, your urethra, your vagina, and your bladder. That's where the estrogen is applied. 
if you don't apply it, I mean, think about if you if you put a raisin in a glass of water, what does it do? It plumps up. Well, when you give this dry skin estrogen, it plumps up. But better yet, it also starts to produce what you're missing, moisture, mucus. And they've watched it under an electron microscope. You can see the skin cells getting bigger, more healthy, and producing wetness again. And that's the ultimate natural way, most natural way of treating this is with your body's own natural mucus. Estrogen will help these cells produce that mucus. So you're, you're letting your fear stop you from doing the one thing that's going to help the most, which is giving that skin where it's the driest estrogen. Now, and you can Google it, genitourinary syndrome of menopause or estrogen atrophy. Um, the, the challenge here is, and, and listen, Marlia, I've worked with lady, little old ladies in their late 80s, and their vulvas are dry potato chips, and they are in agony, utter and total agony. You know, I always know if I'm getting dry, if I can feel my labia when I'm walking. There's like a, it, it's not sliding. Normally when you walk, that skin is so wet, things slide and you don't even notice it. But as things start to get dry, it, it, it starts to chafe. And it's like, oh, I don't know if I really like that or not. The few times that I've ever had that, I always know, okay, I haven't used my estrogen. I need to use my estrogen. The challenge here is that anything you put down there right now is probably going to be uncomfortable, including the estrogen, because you're dry. Your skin is an open book. There's nothing to protect it. But you have to power through that first two weeks. So the first time I used estrogen, um, it I had a, bur a warm, a very warm, slightly burning sensation for about three hours. But I knew to expect that because I knew I was dry. Then the next time I used it, it lasted maybe an hour. Then the third time I used it, it lasted for maybe 15 minutes. And now when I use it, it's like some a little tiny puff of warm air, like poof. I put it on, little tiny bit of warmth, doesn't burn at all anymore because my skin is healthy now. Now, another thing you can do is you can do coconut oil or you can do vulva balm. A little bit of coconut oil every day down there will keep the skin at least slippery. And we want to try to keep that skin as slippery as we can. The problem with coconut oil is it penetrates through cotton. Uh, Michelle says, where do you buy PEA? Right there, hon, icnetwork.org. Just go into our shop. It's a very specific formula that's based on the IC research study. So it's called Piora. So just go to icnetwork.org and click on our shop, and it's right on the front page. It's one of our biggest sellers. Okie dokie artichoke. So coconut oil, but the problem with coconut oil is it really penetrates through clothes and you can end up with an oily spot exactly where you don't want it. So a lot of patients instead prefer, it's called V magic, V magic, V standing for vulva, vulva magic. Uh, the name of the company is Medicine Mamas. This is very popular uh, in women who are dry and who cannot use estrogen for one reason or another. And if I open it up, you can see it's kind of the consistency. It's the consistency of, um, it's not sticky like that Vaseline at all, but it's a nice oil because the, the mucus is, is supposed to push water away. It's supposed to be hydrophobic. 
right? And so you can use V Magic down there too, once or twice a day. And V Magic is um, organic olive oil, a sea buckthorn oil, uh, avocado oil. It's it's about as close as you're going to get to natural the normal consistency of mucus down there. Uh, but they did rebrand it, so this is the new the new box. They're now calling it Volva Bomb. But it says Volva Bomb Daily Volva Care V Magic Organic Formulation. So you can find this on the IC Network store also. Very, very popular V Magic. Mary said they found Citrobacter F. Huh. Okay. Hold on. My memory is good, but my memory is not that good. Hmm. The global and infectious disease. The global infectious disease and epidemiology network named Citrobacic F their pathogen of the month two years ago. Symptoms include a burning sensation during urination, a more frequent urge to urinate, foul smelling urine, blood in the urine. Other symptoms include high grade fever, vomiting, seizures, and more. Left untreated, it can be dangerous and even fatal. It is an emerging health care issue. So are they treating it, Mary? So this was November 30th, 2021, two years ago. Once considered non-virulent, the bacteria has have increasingly become multi-drug resistant or antimicrobial resistant. According to the World Health Organization, AMR is one of the top 10 global public health threats, yada, yada. So it is a gram-negative anaerobic bacteria, rod-shaped, has flagella and are modal, so they move. Oh, they can go from aerobic to anaerobic, yikes. Normally found in water, soil, food, the intestines of humans. First discovered in 1932. It's a common in our gut flora, and many strains are considered good gut bacteria and are beneficial. However, some strains have transformed over time to develop resistance to common antibiotic. As a result, infections can be hard or even impossible to treat. Usually, uh, it's most often a nosocomial infection that you pick up in a healthcare setting. Um, called an opportunistic illness. Yeah, it's really a real difficult time finding the right antibiotic to kill it, honey. I'm going to leave this window open so that I can send you the link on my other computer. Uh, if you email me, icnetwork at mac.com, then I can do that. Peggy says, can you order the next generation urine test on my own and show my doctor? She won't do them. She said they are not reliable. You can. Um, that you can order it on your own from microgen. Um, the challenge is they do need a doctor's sign signature uh, when you send it back in, but they do have a pretty strong network of doctors around the country that will work with you. And again, it's just data, you know, it's just basic information. Uh, Gilda said, is it common to have IC and a prolapse at the same time? Can one be the cause of the other? Yes. 
If you have a prolapse, that means we're dealing with weak muscles and weak muscles are actually, weak muscles often become very tight muscles, which is the foundation for most cases of IC, very, very tight muscles restricting blood supply. So that tells me you got muscle stuff going on, girl. Uh, Carolyn says I was given best care last week, but I was afraid of the side effects. Peggy says, how long does the PR take to work on pain? Well, the study uh, looked at three months. Debbie says, what are my opinion on the Eucora supplements? I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan because that it's operating on the assumption that you've got infection. Uh, most IC patients don't have infection. Only a very small subset of patients do have infection. And, and guys, can, can I just do a little rant here? I am getting more and more complaints from people who have been encouraged to spend thousands of dollars to learn about IC with promises of being cured or healed. And I'm just stunned and outraged at what's happening right now on the internet with people selling these really, really expensive packages to patients. Um, you can gather all that information on our website for free. Um, everybody deserves to make a living. I understand that because I have to make a living too, but I would never try to make a living in that way because we have to understand that patients who are in pain have very limited funds and we don't want to be predatory. Um, and so uh, there's a market for it. If people are very, very wealthy and they can afford that, fine, go for it. But for those patients who are financially limited, just know that the IC network has your back and we want to help you too. And we're not going to charge you all that money. We're probably not going to charge you anything, um, to learn about this and to learn about phenotyping and to learn about, um, the potential treatments that are out there. You know, we've been doing this for 30 years. Um, we have, a, a, we are the veterans of the IC world. Um, and um, I want you to be able to find the best information on the web at no cost. And that's exactly why I built the IC network 30 years ago. kind of a stupid profit model. People would say, yeah, you're profiting off of patients. Where? It's free. <laughs> Everything's been free for years. You know, and then, but then I ran out of money and I had to have a store. And so we sell books and chair cushions and heating pads. And yeah, we have some supplements too. Um, but the, the core work that we do, all the research, everything, it's all free. It always has been and always will be. It is my life's work. Uh, Marlia says, I feel so dry. I'm chicken to put that plunger thing inside. Then use your finger, honey. Just put some on your finger and start on the outside. Just start on the outside. You're so, she said, no sliding, no way. I'm so sensitive. I have to laugh or I cry. I have used coconut oil and bee magic and you're still dry. Yeah, because you're missing the single most important thing. So, you know, if you're using your V-Magic in the morning, use a, use a little bit of the estrogen at night before you go to bed and just rub it on the outside and just slow it. You just, you just have to work from the outside in. I'm sure your doctor's told you to do that. I mean, normally for patients who are very, very dry, they want you to do it every day for three weeks and then you go back down to two or three times. So go back to what your doctor told you to do and just do it. You got to bite your lip and do it, honey, because you're paying a terrible price right now. And the thing, too, is that a compounding pharmacy is a great resource because if you're reacting to a cream base, they can put it in oil. They can put it in almond oil. They can put it in coconut oil. And you, you're not going to react to the almond or the coconut oil. But, there, you know, a good compounding pharmacy like the Women's International Pharmacy uh, it's, it's a great resource for you. Uh, 
Uh, Mary says, you've been on different antibiotics for your infection. No help. Had to see a U.S. doc. They wouldn't treat me here longer than a week. I'm still very worried. I probably got it from a cystoscopy. Yeah, you might need to work with an infectious disease specialist. Yeah, exactly. Carolyn says, I use a, I've used estradiol cream since October 2nd. No sex since August because it hurt. I feel nowhere near ready for sex. Will it be extra painful the first time then? Well, Carolyn, it depends upon why it's, why it's painful. Is it painful because your skin is dry? If that's the case, then lube is your friend. Like literally a half a tube of KY per sex stack. You got to get everything slippery down there. You're good. But if sex is painful because your your muscles are super, super tight, you know, I mean, you got to remember the pelvic floor is a very uh, unusual muscle group because um, they're the only skeletal muscles in the human body that also influence major bodily functions because there's basically three holes in them. There's a hole for the urethra, a hole for the vagina, and a hole for the rectum. So if these muscles are tight, they're going to squeeze them. So they narrow the urethra, they narrow the vagina, they narrow the rectum. So it becomes hard to relax enough to release urine. It becomes hard to have a bowel movement. And it's certainly hard to put a penis up there. It's tight. And so if that's the case, then physical therapy is your friend along with... Um, um, maybe a muscle relaxant like vaginal valium suppositories, baclofen, flexoril, but physical therapy is the gold standard there. Peggy said, I'm still, you're still on Elmeron. My eye exam was good. I get one every year. My question is, can I take it with the Pura or should I stop it? They work in very, very different ways, hon. And there, there have been no drug interactions reported with, with PEA. I mean, I, I, I recently looked at that again. You can Google drug interaction, PEA or palmitoyl ethanolamide. Though I don't see a conflict there. Um, but you should talk to your doctor. And my job is not to give you medical advice. My job is to educate you, inform you, give you a new set of questions, go back to your doctor and say, is this okay? But you got to do your research with the PEA. Mary says the infectious disease doc said, I don't, you don't have an infection based on his distrust of the pathnostic. So the hands are tied and I'm desperate. Mary, do you have fever? So if, if you had an aggressive infection, you would have fever and other systemic symptoms apart from your bladder symptoms. So are you showing any other symptoms in any other part of your body? Chills. Robin says, do we recommend hysterectomy as a treatment for IC? Absolutely not. And as a woman who's had a hysterectomy, listen, the, you know, the problem with Western medicine for the typical IC and pelvic pain patient is that doctors play in their sandbox. Urologists focus on the urinary tract, gynecologists focus on the reproductive tract, gastroenterologists focus on the bowel. And they don't look at relationships. They don't, they don't necessarily look at how do muscles cause some of this pain? How do nerves cause some of this pain? So really, the, there has to be a, a really important reason. Okay, so you say you have endometriosis in IC. If, for example, you had a fibroid tumor that was pushing on your bladder, then yes, we would want to have that fibroid tumor removed. And if necessary, 
If they can only do it with hysterectomy, that makes total sense. Um, endometriosis is a beast. It depends upon how severe your endometriosis is and how progressive it is. And is there any chance that we now have endometrial tissue on your bladder itself from the outside in? Um, the, the, the challenge that we have is, gosh, how do I wanna say this? Um, Pelvic pain is multifaceted with many potential contributing factors. So pain is going to come from skin. Pain is going to come from muscles. Pain is going to come from nerves. Pain is going to come from organs. And before resorting to a major surgical procedure like that, because, honey, I had a hysterectomy for uterine cancer seven years ago. And let me tell you, it's a beast of a surgery. It, at least it was for me. And I didn't even have, well, I had one complication, but I went into, ir I went into uh, muscle spasms for almost a year afterwards. My pelvic floor muscles just fluttered all the time. Um, am I glad I had a hysterectomy? Yeah, because it was to save my life, and it did. Um, I was thoroughly unprepared for how challenging it would be. Um, there is a fabulous website called Hister Sisters, histersisters.com, fabulous website. I would encourage you to go over there. Uh, they have a huge forum. I mean, huge, They're the best on the web. And I'm sure you're going to find a lot of other patients who had hysterectomies or who are considering hysterectomies because of endo so that you can get uh, kind of just more insight and advice from other patients who have had it done. Um, endometriosis is a beast. It's, that's a whole nother meeting we could do on that. Um, I would really encourage you to join the Endometriosis Association. I think they're one of the best nonprofits in the world. And I got all of my information on endometriosis with a big uh, e event and interview I did with their founder. Um, I learned that endometriosis is often caused by chemical exposure, specifically exposure to dioxin, which happens when you burn plastic. Dioxin is the single most toxic chemical ever made by man. When you burn plastic, it comes out of the chimney settles in the grass, the cows eat the grass, gets in the milk, kids drink the milk, gets in the kids, etc. cetera. And um, uh, they have now proven uh, that dioxin as an estrogen mimicker drives endometriosis in some patients. So one of the pieces of advice that they gave to me to give to every endo patient that I work with was to make sure you got rid of every chemical out of your home. Got to clean that house out of oven cleaner, anything harsh, Febreze, scented candles, all that's got to go. You don't want any candles from China, uh, any room sprays, anything at all like that. We have got to dramatically reduce chemical load for patients with endo because some of those chemicals are estrogen mimickers and they can drive it. And every year we get a new chemical or two added to that list. It's real. So we have on the IC Network website in our self-help section um, a page on how, how to do that, how to get the chemicals out of your home, um, and making sure that you switch to uh, plant-based products rather than chemical-based products. And, and, you know, now that Christmas is here, I got to tell you, okay, everybody has some aunt, some grandma who goes to... Walgreens or goes to Joann's or goes somewhere and they get a cheap set of candles and they give it as a gift and you open it up and it reeks. It's like, oh God, 
<laughs> hey, Grandma's sitting there. Thank you, Grandma. Thank you so much. This was so nice of you. And then you wait for when her attention is diverted and you very quietly slip out and you take it with you and you go hide it in the garage. You've got to get it out of your house. Oh, God, my, my grandma was so bad with that. No, it's so funny. Diane said, I didn't think. Oh, hi, Sue. Uh, here, hold on. Sue, I uh, was working with another uh, horseback rider at a bad fall. Same thing as you. Only she was riding English and show jumping. Uh, Diane, let's see, hold on. I didn't think the estrogen cream would help and was concerned about the side effects, but it's made such a difference, but it took a good six to eight months to get the full benefit. It takes time. Yeah, it's going to take time if those cells are really dry. Um, Carolyn says, okay, hold on. Mary said, no fever, but very bad bladder, occasional chills, not consistent. The bladder is bad. I'm on antibiotics, but feel like they aren't working. I go to the doc. They do cultures here. So it won't show due to me being on antibiotics. It got so bad. I'm medicating and guessing on the meds myself and seeing what's happening. Yeah. You know, you know, Mary, you're, I know you feel like you're in a no win situation and kind of you are in a way because you're taking the antibiotics to reduce the pain out of desperation. But when you read about that bacteria, you find that it's resistant to most antibiotics. So you're probably kind of feeling better from the anti-inflammatory effect of the antibiotics as compared to them killing anything, maybe. I don't know. I don't know what to say to you. I can't give you medical advice. I, I would just say that if you can hold off for a couple of days to show your doctor your true state, that might be a powerful educational tool for that doctor. It's a tricky situation. Maybe getting a second opinion from another infectious disease doctor, if possible. I don't, I don't think you can do that though, but or even just calling Microgen and asking if they have anybody that they work with, explaining your situation. You never know. Sue says, the sandbox thing is true. To some extent, I saw a urogynecologist for 20 years and was wrongly diagnosed, but you see a urologist, Dr. Peters, who does play outside of a sandbox, so to speak. Exactly. Alina says, do not understand how do I not have a UTI but having all the symptoms and positive for night and you're, if you're positive for nitrites, microhematuria and high leukocytes, then you could be a fungal infection, honey. Uh, but anytime you're positive in nitrites, that proves that an infection is happening. So it may be an infection because nitrites are not made by the human body. Nitrites are only made by bacteria or an infectious organism. So you would be a perfect case for a next generation DNA urine test, in my opinion. So go to bladderhealth.org, bladderhealth.org, and check out that website. Or go onto the IC network and look at the blog. And, the, and I just did a big video on this too. Marlia said, gas and bloating is also another issue, especially after drinking water. Go figure on that one. Any ideas? I try to eat bland, no gassy foods. I'm taking your advice. And I got some straws because I know I gulp. I have allergies, so I'm always clearing my throat. If it's not one issue, it's for others. Well, um, I will tell you for me, my IBS is gone. It's really rare that I ever have bowel cramping now. Um, but I am very prone to gas in my stomach happened last night. Um, and 
it's quite interesting. Um, it's a symptom of gastroparesis, which I've been diagnosed with. Gastroparesis means delayed stomach emptying. It means the nerves in your stomach are not, are slow instead of fast. And so what happens is food sits in your stomach for a long period of time and starts to ferment. And that produces gas. And so um, I have Gaviscon that, honestly, I chew one or two every day. I, I mean, I was absolutely diagnosed with it. I, I had an endoscopy at four o'clock in the afternoon and my, the eggs I had that morning were still in my stomach. And so um, I try to avoid foods that are hard to digest. Um, and when I do that, I'm much, much better. So I don't eat um, leafy greens at all, at all. Or I don't eat granola or anything at all like that. I want foods that are calming and soothing to my stomach. Um, and I'm so much better now that I've done that, but that little bit of gas every day is there. It's not a lot. I don't feel terrible. Um, and also when I drink water, honestly, I swallow air. So I use a straw and that really helps me stop. You know, if you're drinking out of a lot, I just swallow air. It's crazy. But if I drink with a straw, I'm a lot better. If you're stressed, you could be gulping air, which can make you gassy because when people are stressed, people don't breathe right. Yeah. Carolyn says, urologist thinks the amitriptyline has stopped working for me, but then said double up on it. Well, the uh, in the AUA guidelines, the, uh, the ideal dosage for amitriptyline is 75 milligrams. Uh, the challenge with a dose that high is that there can be a lot of side effects. So as they say in the guidelines, it's kind of hard for patients to get up to that high dose um, because of the dry mouth, dry eyes, weight gain, irregular heart rate, et cetera, that the low dose antidepressants can cause. And, and also antidepressants are associated with cognitive decline if used every day for three years or longer. So we kind of have a trend to kind of try to step away from that a little bit more, especially in patients who are a little bit older. So I think it depends on dosage and how you handle that dosage. You get, I guess you won't know until you try. Um, but it's a amitriptyline is a, one of the harder medications for patients to tolerate. I only got three months at 10 milligrams before my heart was a mess. Oh, really messed my heart up badly. You know, normally, so the other thing that amitriptyline can do is it can change the conductivity of your heart muscle. So normally your heartbeat is controlled by two nodes, your AV node and your SA node. So your heartbeat is beep, 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 beep. That's each node firing. Amitriptyline turned on a third node to me. I wore a heart monitor for a, uh, a month and they proved it. So my heartbeat was beep, 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 beep. Freaky. And if two of those nodes broke, uh, came out at the same time, it was very uncomfortable. And it's been 20 years now and I still occasionally have that. So uh, Don says, had a Klebsiella UTI for over a month, thought I was in a flare, took an antibiotic. You've been clear for one and a half months, but still in a lot of pain. Could this be taking a longer time to heal? Yes, the bladder is the slowest healing organ in the body and pretty much six weeks minimum for the cells to, re to repair themselves after a really significant infection. Um, I'm, I'm concerned that you're in a lot of pain though. And so the question is, where is the pain? Uh, Don, where is the pain? And when does the pain happen? Before you pee, while you're peeing, or after you're done peeing?
And just so you know, you guys on YouTube, you're on a five second delay between posts. Do you have to wait five seconds before you can answer? Mary says, what would you do if you were in my, if you were me? You know what I do? I would go on PubMed, which is our National Library of Medicine. PubMed, and I would type in the bacteria. And I would look at all the new research in the last year or two. The secret to PubMed is that when you look at the authors, there's a little plus sign and you can click on that and it will tell you who the primary author is and it will often give you their email address. And you know, what's my motto? Be bold and mighty forces shall come to thy aid. I say, summarize your case in two paragraphs and send it to that researcher and see what they say. I like being bold. So that's what I would do. Summarize my case in two paragraphs, not more, and say you've got, a, 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 you know, that you were looking at their, their research on this bacteria and you were wondering if they could review your symptoms and perhaps provide other treatment options. And for all you know, there's going to be a top researcher in that within 100 miles, and you'll be perfect. So be bold, my friend, and mighty forces shall come to thy aid. Uh, um, Marlia says, uh, will Gaviscon help the gas? I thought it was an antiacid. What Gaviscon does is it puts a foamy layer over the top of your stomach contents, and it prevents the gas from coming out. I mean, that's straight from my IBS doctor. She's the one who said, do Gaviscon. And I do the Gaviscon original mint tablets, two of old. Don't do the cherry. It's awful. Get the original. That was a staple in my dad's life with his hernia. And that has been the staple in my, in my life with uh, a little bit of mild gastroparesis. Uh, Denise says, gynecologist told me to put astrogel on applicator and it really helped. Yeah, it does. Anything, anything that will help it slide, astrogel, KY, whatever. Wendy said, what, what did you say helped with bloating? Okay. Bloating's different than gas. So, um, Oh, okay. Because there are so many different ways I can answer this question. Um, we have something called the IC belly, where in the middle of a flare, your belly gets very big. And it's like you wake up with a flat stomach and four hours later, you look seven months pregnant. What the hell is this? That's an inflammatory process. That's inflammation. And that comes and goes, comes and goes. It's not typical bloating. Um, I have come to learn in my age, because hello, I am a wee bit older now, that what bloats me the most is anything made with white flour especially old cookies with preservatives. So like, uh, or spaghetti or eating a lot of white bread, um, noodles, um, again, sugary white cookies. Um, I, and the, the worst of all, Easy peasy breakfast cereal. Oh my God. Oh my God. 
Cheerios, all that stuff, any of the breakfast cereals, whoo, I would blow it up like a stug pig. I would be nauseous and gassy and even dizzy all day. That was my life in my 20s with my IBS. And, and I was able to directly see that box cereals like Raisin Bran, anything like that was deadly for me. I just, if I had it in the morning, I was miserable all day, really swollen belly, again, nauseous, and even a little dizzy. And once I stopped eating breakfast cereal, like 80 to 85% of my bloating stopped completely. Um, and now, you know, years later, um, I haven't eaten any of those cereals in 30 years, and I'm so much better. Uh, that's quite common, that type of food sensitivity. And then also, it would be reasonable for you to be tested for celiac. I, I, was, I was negative for celiac, but I will tell you that my body prefers going gluten-free. Um, I have a gluten-free pancake mix that I use. Uh, my The bread that I eat is Ezekiel bread, which is not made from processed flours. It's made from sprouts. It's a lot easier on the gut. I've never gotten bloated with Ezekiel bread. Um, and when I... Um, uh, now, I, I did make uh, organic pumpkin cookies uh, for my sister, and then I made a batch for me. I'm not having any problems with those. I, don't, I always buy organic flowers. And if I'm going to buy cookies, I don't buy American cookies. I buy European cookies. Because the flour in America, the wheat has been treated with Roundup right before harvest. And they have been able to trace this lyphosate all the way up the food chain, the massive levels of lyphosate. Well, massive might be the wrong word, but they have found lyphosate in Oreos and Ritz crackers, all of those. Um, and I'm really not interested in eating lyphosate. And so I bought, for example, um, gingerbread cookies from England yesterday. And I brought little mince pies yesterday, which I love to eat. I'm channeling my Swedishness. Um, and then I bought some um, uh, Italian Christmas bread, which I'm going to save for Christmas Eve. And I, and they don't allow glyphosphates on wheat in Europe. And so um it's just another example of the American food industry being massively imp influenced by, you know, the chemical industry, in my opinion. Um, Wendy said, I have both. After my hysterectomy, the gas trapped in my pelvic area very bad every day and nothing seemed to help. I have ICPFD, IBS, and just diagnosed with endometriosis on my colon most, mostly. You know, Wendy, my sister had that after she had two C-sections. Actually, technically she had three because um, she had an ectopic pregnancy. Um, and the scar tissue uh, wrapped around her colon and caused terrible pain. Um, so the fact that you have, and remember that you have endometrial tissue on your colon, endometrial tissue is like tough thread. It's tough. It can wrap around your colon and block your colon. So if I were to guess, it's that you, you have scar tissue that's, that's influencing and compressing your colon somewhere. And so, um, you know, this might be a circumstance where you might want to have another laparotomy so that they can take a look and try to remove anything, especially if it's wrapping around your colon. That's going to be very, very important that they try to remove that.
What do your doctors say? What are your doctors telling you about that? Um, Evie says, hello, Evie. Nice to meet you. I have IC, IBS, vulvodynia, severe anemia, and PGAD. Any advice? I'm not on any meds. I try to control my symptoms with diet, but it's not nutritious. Okay. Oh, and Wendy, you had your hysterectomy in August. So, honey, you're still in your post-op recovery. You know, there's a three-month period where you still have fresh stitches. And that all that post-op advice about you not lifting heavy things, girl, don't lift anything heavy for another th six months. You know, hysterectomy, there, there are thick stitches on the inside holding everything together. And then you've got thinner stitches on the outside that are kind of keeping the tissues closed. Um, and you can really hurt yourself and hurt those wounds when they do that. Uh, when you do that. And so you're somebody else that I would suggest that you go to the Hister Sisters website so that you can look at the after hysterectomy instructions and the real patient stories about that. Um, I had terrible um, pelvic floor spasms for a year and they started six weeks post-surgery and it felt like there was a hand up inside my vagina grabbing onto where my cervix used to be and pulling, it was this pulling sensation, especially if I sat down hard in my car seat, it was like, ah, oh. oh, I can still remember, oh God, I can still remember, I was trying to figure it out, and oh, what did my doctor want me to do? No, I was just putting my estrogen cream into my vagina like two months after the surgery, and I touched the um scar oh my god it was you can't even describe what that's like it was awful it's just awful and i remember i walked out of my bedroom and my elderly father who i was caring for at the time was sitting at the kitchen table and i went oh my god i don't want to do that again and he goes what I said, I just touched it, and he's like, Yeah, <laughs> the poor guy, I was just struggling. So, you know, and again, honey, all your nerves are really hot right now, they're really traumatized right now. You've had major surgery, you've got nerve sensitivity, you got muscles that are tight, muscles that are funky. You're still in your post op recovery. I wouldn't let anybody touch me down there for uh, let's see, I had my surgery in May. I finally let my doctor look in October. I would have slugged him. I was so awful. It was just, um, and you know, it's just, it all healed eventually, but they're not lying when they say it takes a year to recover from hysterectomy. You know, you're just, you're just going through it. So being calm, working on soothing those muscles, calming nerves down, doing a lot of deep breathing. Uh, I don't know if it's you're ready for pelvic floor physical therapy yet. It might be too soon. Hard to say. It would have been too soon for me at three months. Okay, I want to go to Evie. Evie, welcome. Girl, we have got to talk. So, um, you have two very clear and very different conditions going on. So let's talk about the PGAD, persistent genital arousal disorder. That is a result of tight pelvic floor muscles squeezing your pudendal nerve. We call that IC subtype four pudendal neuralgia. The correct therapy for that is physical therapy, because we have got to get the muscle to release so that it's not squeezing the nerve anymore. And we want to try to calm those nerves down. Sometimes a, a doctor will do what we call a diagnostic nerve block just to try to figure out where on the nerve, which nerve is traumatized so much and where. I have a pudendal neuralgia myself. It's in my left butt cheek. And it's by my sit bone, actually. 
And it's on a little wisp of a nerve fiber of the pudendal nerve that goes backwards. It's a little branch of the pudendal nerve that goes backwards. So I feel your pain, my dear. I feel your pain. Ultimately, in the end, no supplement diet is going to address that. There is a fundamental flaw with your muscles. They are tight. And so you need a proper pelvic floor assessment to see what's going on from a muscle and nerve standpoint down in your pelvis. Um, uh, there is a, if you really want to dive into it, this is the book to get. It is called Breaking Through Chronic Pelvic Pain. And this is a master class in muscles and nerves. And it is filled with successful case studies. But ultimately, in the end, if you got tight muscles, as I do, on my left side from a weak SI joint, no diet's going to fix that. You need physical therapy. And physical therapy is stunningly successful. The barrier with physical therapy for some patients, aside from the fact that it can be expensive, um, $80 a session, $100 a session, um, is that the best physical therapy is done internally. So let me get my model here. And you guys, it's really cold here. That's why I'm wearing my sweater dress. All righty then. So let us, let me introduce you to your pelvis. So let's look at it from the front. Okay. So here you go. We've got hip bone, hip bone, right? And if we look at it from the top down, look, you can see a lot of muscles down there. These are your pelvic floor muscles or skeletal muscles. These are muscles that help you move your legs. These are muscles that help you open and close your knees. They help you balance. But they're flat, right? They, they tend to sit on top of the bone. Okay, so let's look at the pelvis from the back. Spinal cord, vertebrae, and this triangular bone right here is your sacrum. And then, of course, we have our tailbone. And I want you to see all the things that attach to the tailbone. The tailbone is very active. It actually helps us balance. It moves. Your tailbone can move to the left. It can move to the right. If your tailbone's out of position, that's not good because it's going to stretch on one side and tighten on the other side. So there's a lot of interconnectedness going on here with these muscles. So let me... Okay, so you see these four holes in your sacrum. Your spinal cord comes down here and it delivers nerves through each hole. And those nerves come out here. You see that? So these nerves come into the pelvic cavity. And what this model does not show is that the nerves actually travel through the muscles. The nerves travel through the muscles. So let me see if I can get a picture for you so that you can see what it looks like. Let's see here. I love this book. I love this book. Everybody should read this book. And it's free on Kindle Unlimited. No freaking excuses. Get it. It's good. 
Uh, you can buy it in the IT network too. Uh, but here, hold on. I just want to, I want to get the right picture here because I want you to see where the pudendal neuralgia happens. I just have to find it. Oh, it's hard to find the pictures. Bear with me here. The muscles of the pelvic diaphragm. Treating dysfunctional muscle. No. 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 <laughs> this is funny. There are excellent pictures in this. I just have to find it. Dang it. Oh, wait, wait, wait. It's, oh, I know where it is. It's up by the bike seat. Okay, hold on. I got to find the bike seat picture. Yeah, the, the one challenge with this book is there's no index. Ah, here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here it is. Here it is. This is what I wanted you to see. Look at this picture. See that? You see those three nerves? They're coming out of the sacrum. And do you see how they're actually going through muscle fibers? So those four nerves come out on each side separately. Then they combine into one to go through what we call the Alcox Canal. And then after they leave the Alcox Canal, they separate again. Okay, so you can directly see here that if this muscle is tight up here, you're screwed. It's going to hit the nerve. It's going to hit the nerve. So pelvic floor physical therapy, along with therapies that will calm this nerve down, uh, it can be uh, Piora, which is a supplement, which it calms nerves down. Gabapentin, which is a prescription. Topical lidocaine, if you're having areas of numbness on your skin, anything at all like that. The focus is in calming nerves and relaxing muscles. Okay? Now, speaking of gas, um, let's talk about your IC and your IBS and vulvodynia. So um, we now under, so I have exactly the same thing, hon. I had, I, I, in fact, I had frequency urgency at 14. I had severe vulvodynia in high school. Then I had IBS in my, or my 20s. I had bladder pain for the first time in my 30s, et cetera. Why did that happen to me? Well, I broke my tailbone when I was 14, the year it began. And what did that do that caused my muscles to get very, very tight? I had a lot of pain on my perineum. Uh, it, it felt like somebody rubbed sandpaper over my skin down between my legs. I mean, it was so bad. And I'd be at the, I'd at, be at the doctor just crying. And the doctor would say, Jill, you have the most sensitive skin we've ever seen but there's nothing wrong here. Your skin is just sensitive. You know, thanks a bunch. Well, it was this book that explained the perineal pain. And I wanted to get another picture here because I can show this to you. So here's another picture of the nerve if you want to see it. See that nerve? So you can see these nerves coming right off, right out of the sacrum right through the muscle, etc. That's where pudendal neuralgia happens, somewhere in here. Or it can even happen down here if the muscle down here is tight. All righty. Now, what was I going to look for here? Okay, so I want to find a picture of the perineal body. So why was my perineum like on fire all the time. Okay. 
So woman's anatomy from the top down, clitoris, urethra, vagina, rectum. And you can see the muscles. You can see the levator in a muscle that goes from side to side. And you can see it, how it wraps around the urethra and the vagina and the rectum. You see that little bump right there? You see those little muscles that attach to that bump right there? Yeah, that's called the perineal body. Immediately under the skin of the perineum is an attachment point for four freaking muscles. That's why my skin was on fire because my muscles were very, very tight and restricting blood flow. So again, we want to make sure you have a proper pelvic floor assessment to see what's going on with your muscles. Um, the uh, the uh, yes to the sandpaper. Did I also have PGAD? Yes, I had PGAD for about six to eight weeks. And yes to the perineal body. Exactly, girl. Exactly. Right? And the thing is, is that, you know, we associate this with yeast. Surely I have a yeast infection. Surely that's what's causing all of this, right? No. And, and God, we should have had stock and monostat. I can't tell you the number of prescriptions I use to try to deal with this vulvodynia. And Evie, I got to tell you something. So anyway, so I had my pelvic floor worked on and calm my nerves down, completely went away. And for the most part, I don't have it anymore. But a couple of years ago, I started getting pinpricks. And it was, a, it was along my pubic hairline on the outside. And it, and it started directly in the front. And so you know that, sens that sensation you get when you, like you pull a pubic hair, it's kind of a tugging sensation but it's kind of sharp and uncomfortable. Or if you shave and your hair is, your pubic hair is growing out and it, it gets, it, it rubs against your underwear. It's like, Oh, awful. Right. Okay. So I started getting this poking sensation. And so what did I do? I went in, made sure I, I, you know, trim my pubic hair, make sure they weren't too long, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Well, over a period of a week, it got, it moved from the front all the way to the back on both sides. And finally, at that end of the week, I was getting poked by pins randomly, left side, right side, left side, right side. And it was so uncomfortable. And my vulva turned bright red. So I go to urgent care. And the doctor, which is our urgent OBGYN, which they can do. Um, and Lamo, pelvic floor all the way, girl. Okay, so I go to urgent care, see this old, old guy, and he goes, I think you've got a raging yeast infection. And he, he, he took some skin really hard, looked at it under a microscope, and, yeah, and he's like, yeah, I think, I think you've got yeast. Gave me monostat or whatever. It wasn't monostat. It was something better than that. Didn't work. Two weeks later, I was miserable. So then I make an appointment with my OBGYN. It's like, help me, help me, help me. What the hell is going on down here? Why do I have all these pinpricks down here? And she goes, God, Jill, it looks like eczema. Do you wear a mini pad? I swear it's in the shape of your mini pad. Let's do some steroids. And I'm like, okay, give me the steroids. Six weeks later, it was worse. Steroids didn't touch it. And I was exasperated. And so I asked for a referral to the pelvic pain specialist in San Francisco. And they wanted me to drive down, but I was caring for my parents and I didn't have coverage. So I had a phone appointment. The physical therapy, the pelvic pain doctor, a gynecologist, she'd already looked at my history and she goes, Jill, don't you know what this is? And I'm like, no. She goes, honey, your pelvic floor muscles are tight again. She said, this is, you, ha you have muscles so tight, they're squeezing the nerves. That's what this is coming from. And I'm going, but I've never experienced that on the outside of my vulva. 
along the hairline. She goes, ah, we see it all the time. We see it all the time. And I'm like, what do we do? She goes, I'm sending you back to physical therapy. And I'm going to give you a topical jelly of lidocaine and estrogen to help silence the nerves on your skin down there. And it worked. I go back to physical therapy. The, the physical therapist goes, man, girl, you are tight. What did you do? <laughs> and so I started the physical therapy and then the, the topical estrogen to silence the nerves on the skin. I still have it. If I ever feel that pinpricking sensation, I whip that out. And so Evie, you got to get this book because this book, he talks about that. He talks about when he does a diagnostic workup of patients with pelvic pain and he, he looks to the nerves, he looks for nerve sensitivity deep and then under the skin in a subcutaneous area and then also on the skin. And when he finds that, that's what he suggested. We have to silence the nerves from the skin down, and we've got to treat the muscles from internally out. So, so this book, I think, will help you understand the anatomy. And let me just ask you a question here. If you go back in time to when this all began for you, I was 14. How old were you? How old were, were you when this started for you? Okay. So when we do our IC phenotyping to try to figure out what patient group you're in, the general rule is if it begins in your teens or 20s, look first to injury. So back when you were 23, can you remember any accidents? Were you an athlete? Were any falls? Were you a gymnast, ice skater, horseback rider, bike rider? Did you have a baby? Can you remember any pelvic trauma at all? If I were to guess, and it's a guess, but a lot of patients want context here. You sustained an injury. And you may never figure it out. And a lot of patients, when I work with them, when they call me and we do coaching, you know, we I really probe about teenage years and, and trauma. Were you an athlete? And so many patients will say, I remember nothing. And it's like, and then after an hour, they go, oh, yeah. You know, yeah, I did actually have something bad happen. Uh, Margie says, what kind of food do I eat? I eat simple, fresh, healthy food, preferably organic if it's if it's a thin skinned fruit or vegetable. I don't eat fast food. Honestly, I haven't had a cheeseburger in 30 years. I mean, a fast food burger. I'll make my own burgers. That's fine. Um. I'm finding that I like lighter meals now. I don't like heavier meals. Um, I'm And I'm one of those people where because I had such severe IBS, um, food was never my friend anyway. And so I can eat the same food every day and I'd be happy. So I eat Ezekiel bread. I usually have Ezekiel bread toast with almond butter or cheese. Although I had cinnamon toast this morning or I'll make French toast or I'll make uh, gluten-free pancakes. I usually don't eat lunch, but I usually eat an apple or and a banana and an, a kind bar, an almond bar. And then for dinner, it's all about the stir fried vegetables and stuff like that. Okay, getting back to Evie. I was kicked in my teens right on the vagina, but it didn't hurt. That was around the age of 13, 14. But I'd always had UTI since I was little. So that's a big trauma. And the thing is, is that the kick I endured, it felt kind of numb at one time. It was a direct tip of the shoe to the vagina. Yeah, there you go, honey. So one of the things that this book talks about is what happens 
to muscle when you are injured. And if we go back and we look at this picture here, so these muscles sustained a direct blow, your levator anal muscles. So they suffered a compression injury. And actually, this is a good picture because you can see that there are actually three layers of muscles. These are the shallow muscles, these are the middle level muscles, and these are the deeper muscles. So that shoe, the point of that shoe penetrated here and probably got all the way to here. Okay, so now we have a direct trauma to the muscle and a direct trauma to the nerve. So what happens then, and this book explains it quite well, is that you often end up with a weakened muscle at the site of that injury that forms a trigger point. Okay, so you can see this here, a trigger point. So, I mean, muscles are amazing. They're so fascinating how they work. They're basically longitudinal fibers like this. And so when a muscle is at rest, the fibers are kind of end to end. But when muscles compress, they slide. They slide. And that's what that's what that that pop muscle is on your bicep is these muscles have now slid together. And you can see they're thicker because they've slid together. And these muscles also have what we call phili. They've got little tiny attachments that kind of lock them together. But then when the muscle relaxes, the, phi the pili or phili release, and you go back to this point, okay? But sometimes what happens is it gets locked here. You're locked. You're locked down. The muscle simply isn't releasing. That's called a trigger point. I've had one in the right side of my neck since my 20s when I got rear-ended. Right there. Never gone away. Sucker drives me crazy. Okay. So look at what happens. Here's a trigger point. And this picture is an even better picture. Because when you have trigger points, look at what they do. They compress the blood supply and they compress nerves, but it's really blood supply. So it's healthy here, but past the trigger point, we don't have good blood supply. So what Dr. Weiss says is that history of injury results in what we call latent trigger points. You might not feel them, but you sustained an injury, it was there. And usually what we see is a series of injuries that on their own would be no big deal, but we've got little trigger point, little trigger point, little trigger point. And then sometime in your 20s or 30s, something very innocuous happens and bam, they all turn on. And these latent trigger points become active, painful trigger points. So you desperately need a pelvic floor assessment. Uh, it feels like a UTI, but it's not really a UTI. You say you had UTI since you were little. Um, uh, were your urine cultures positive or negative? And if they were positive, what did they find? Sometimes we see birth defects. Sometimes, like I had one patient that I worked with who they found a birth defect in one of her pelvic floor muscles when she was in her 40s, um, which, is, which is crazy. Um, um, and sometimes it can relate to childhood trauma. Sometimes it can relate to uh, parenting and people who are bedwetters. Um, if you were beaten as a child because you wet the bed, 
uh, that child is going to now compress and tighten these pelvic floor muscles subconsciously, which is going to create yet more muscle tension later on in life. And there are some women who have had tight muscles from childhood, and they've never known normal sex. They've never not had pain with sex. They dread going to the gynecologist. They know putting the speculum, speculum in, it's going to hurt like hell. All because of very, very tight muscles. Any luck with a pelvic wand? Hell yeah. I love my wands. Definitely. But you can't figure it out on your own. You have to go to a physical therapist at least once so that they can do a proper pelvic floor examination so we can get the names of the muscles, left side, right side, front, back, low, high. You've got to have an expert study those muscles first. Yeah. Well, just remember, everything feels like a UTI, even injuries. Because there's only two nerves, and they're the nerves that control frequency, urgency, and pain. Uh, hold on a sec. Renee says, eat clean. It is hard, but can be done. Definitely. The advantage of learning how to do it on your own is you'll never be dependent on somebody else. If you if your muscles get tight, as mine frequently get tight, I got my wand. I know what to do. Give me five minutes so I can get it to relax. Edith said you could have been wiping wrong. You were only five. Yeah, maybe. But see, the other thing, too, though, is skin sensitivity. So that's the other connection. The One of the connections between IC, IBS, vulvodynia, TMJ, fibromyalgia, et cetera, is a very, very sensitive nervous system. I mean, I'm a redhead. Hello. I got, I'm very, very sensitive. I couldn't use bubble bath when I was a kid. It always burned. Um, and so the other thing that could be playing a role in these multiple pain conditions for you, especially if you have fibro or TMJ or migraines, is you could also have a, a, a little bit of central nervous system injury going on. We call it central sensitization. And um, what the research shows for these patients, and I'm in this group, uh, is um, our brain is stuck in fight or flight. We got to get the brain out of fight or flight. You're just worried the wand will make my symptoms worse? No, honey. No, 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 no. Let me go get my wand. Hold, hold on. I'll show you. Well, actually, I've got samples here. Okay, so there are lots of different types of wands. Um, this is a wand. This is the wand that I use called IC Relief. You can get it from Desert Harvest. They bought the company uh, that made this. The original company was I IC Relief. Well, icrelief.com. Okay, anyway, they're at Desert Harvest. The advantage of the glass, number one, is it's really smooth and it's really, really easy, easy, easy to clean. So let me get my model here. Okay. So let's look at this from the top down. So most of these muscles are on the inside of bone and you can't reach them from the outside. The best way to reach them is from the inside. Hence, Finger in your vagina, right? So look at how far I can go with my finger. I can get all the way to the deepest muscles, the piriformis muscle, right? And the goal of physical therapy here is they're going to look for trigger points and they're going to gently massage them out. Tight muscle, see these muscles lay flat on the bone. But when they get tight, they lift off of the bone. And when they lift off of the bone, they start interfering with other things. And so our goal here with this therapy is to relax them, to get them to flatten back down and drop down where they're supposed to be. You see that? So a physical therapist is just going to very gently, you know, they're going to go for the front muscles too. And it's so interesting because they can actually touch your hip bone and it doesn't hurt at all. There's no nerves there. So, you know, a good physical therapist just with a with a quick five minute examination can touch all the muscles 
and tell you where the problem is, right? But it is physically impossible for you to get this deep on your own pelvic floor. You just can't contort. Thus, we bring in the wand. And so if I insert my wand, you can see this right here. Look at how easy it is. Look at how easy it is. I've, listen, I've been doing internal, my own internal work with a wand for mm, eight or nine years now. Um, there's a learning curve. And that's why going to a physical therapist the first time is really, really important because, and, and reading, reading a book. I mean, I want you, when you go to that appointment and you're laying on your back and they've got their finger inside you, I want you to know the names of the muscles they're touching. And I want you to be able to visualize where they're working and what they're touching. So your knowledge level is really important here to your success. That's why this book, Breaking Through Chronic Pelvic Pain, it's so important for you to read and invest in. Um, and so um, uh, they will give you that basic, basic assessment, left side, right side, front, back, low, high, et cetera. So for me, I was tied on my left side. I have my pudendal neuralgia on my left side. And... And so she sent me home. She said, okay, time for a wand. And the first couple of times I used it, I was lost. So I lay on my bed. I put my feet up on the wall. And again, I stuck it in the first couple of times. I had no freaking idea what I was doing. None. There's a learning curve. And so what the... This, when I went back to the physical therapist and said, okay, I tried, but I don't know what I'm doing. Please help me. She said, it's a J, it's a J shape. You move it in a J shape. And I'm like, huh? So I go back home, try again. J shape? No sense. Made no sense to me at all until I read this book. <laughs> Uh, until I read this book. This book taught me the J shape. So let me see if I can. And I just went through this with somebody else. How can I? Okay. Let me grab this model again. Okay. So let's look at it again. And I want you to think of your tailbone as the center. Because it is. The tailbone is the center of your pelvic floor. And you can see that you have muscles that go to the left and you have muscles that go to the right. So think now about two capital J's facing each other. Here's a J shape, whoops. And here's the other J shape, whoops. <laughs> That's the J shape, like this. So when I, when I do, number one, always use KY, always. Um, I look for um, tender areas. Healthy muscle feels like a raw chicken breast. Tight muscle feels like painful beef jerky. Once I find an area that's painful, that's where I'm working. And I, I will just literally, for about two minutes, I'll just, I'll just rub it gently, just gently rub it. That's all it takes to get the muscle to release and drop down and I'm good. So I'm not afraid of it at all. The only time that only once in all this time did I push too hard because my, my muscles on my left side are always tight because of my SI joint. And I just dug in one night. I just like, I just went for it. I really put a lot of pressure on my wand and I could tell that um, I was reaching nerves that I should not be reaching. And I immediately stopped. Didn't hurt. Well, I stopped it before it could hurt badly. It's like, okay, 
you're going too hard. <laughs> and I backed off. Um, so yeah, did my symptoms get worse first? Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to say, so, um, after my hysterectomy and they finally sent me back to physical therapy, um, and then, you know, I was having involuntary muscle spasms. My muscles were quivering like this all the time down there for a year, almost a year, 10 months. And my OBGYN, the surgeon, finally looked at me and he gasped and he goes, oh, my God, I can see your muscles quivering. You're having involuntary muscle spasms. And I'm like, yeah, what are we going to do about it? And he said, physical therapy. And I'm like, sign me up. And he goes, well, I just want to warn you, most women would drop out. And I'm like, why? And he goes, because it can hurt at first. And I'm like, I'm not like most women. Sign me up. I want to fix it. I never found physical therapy itself to be painful. The first time I went, the physical therapist was like, yeah, you're tight. I didn't find it. I didn't find it painful until I got up and walked out to my car. And then I was like, oh, okay. We definitely worked with some muscles. And the act of, I sat down in my car rather hard. And that was very painful. I burst into tears. I drove home crying. I got home, grabbed a heating pad, sat in my recliner for eight hours with the heating pad. But I didn't give up. I knew to expect that. So I called the physical therapist, went back the next week and said, okay, this, this happened. Took a day or two. And she goes, okay. This good information, we did the physical therapy again, a little bit less intense. Again, I didn't find the physical therapy itself. And, you know, I might have grim, you know, physical therapists, they watch your face. Do you, are you wincing? You know, your ability to communicate with your physical therapist and tell them how you're feeling is critical here. Um, and I'm a laugher. Even if I'm in pain, I tend to laugh. So what they do is they look at your face to see if you're grimacing. So again, I didn't find the hands-on physical therapy difficult at all until I started walking out. And again, I was like, ah, oh, damn it. Sat in my car again, burst into tears again. But it only lasted a couple of hours this time. And I'm like, okay, that's progress. I got this. Go back the third time. And she and I said, okay, it happened again. She goes, okay. So the third time we did it, walked out to my car, and guess what? Oh, it's better. I didn't cry. I was good. Uh, I mean, I still used a heating pad when I got home, but Fourth time, even better. Fifth time, even better. So, you know, we just have to understand that if these muscles have been in tension for a long time, they're not going to go back into shape with one physical therapy appointment. It's going to take a little bit of time. And for those of us who have tight pelvic floor muscles, listen, a skeletal muscle relaxant is your friend. You can ask for a vaginal valium suppository. You can ask for Flexeril or Baclofen. I take Flexeril almost every night right now, a half a pill. I'm doing that for my neck and my TMJ. My doctor wanted me to do that. And honestly, I feel better and I'm sleeping now. Um, but having a skeletal muscle relaxant that you can use after physical therapy to kind of take the edge off that tightness, gold. So you can ask you can ask your doctor for that, and you have the involuntary muscle spasms too, right? So so girl, we're twins. We're twins. I broke my tailbone at the age of fourteen, and you got kicked. Physical therapy is transformational. My IC is gone. My IBS is gone. My vulvodynia is gone.
I know that my condition is neuromuscular. It is not all in my head. It is not all in your head. We were injured. And so don't be afraid of physical therapy. We just had yet another research study that proved beyond a shadow of a doubt, physical therapy far more successful than bladder therapies for most IC patients. Why? Because 80 to 85% of IC patients are muscle patients. And I think that, you know, it would be very interesting for you to do something like Peora, which is what I do, to see if this might calm some of the nerves down a little bit. Because I, so I'm very invested personally on a daily basis in keeping my nerves calm and my muscles healthy. And I have not done my internal work in about two weeks and I can tell, and I need to do it. Like literally as I'm sitting here, I've got pain in my left butt cheek. And it's like that, this pain right around the sit bone. Oh, and I'm not sitting on my chair cushion. Uh, let me put my chair cushion back there. That'll help. If you want to talk, Evie, give me a phone call this week. You can reach me at 800-928-7496. I answer the corporate extension and the patient education extension. And we also have a sales extension for our warehouse. We have three, no, we have four employees. <laughs> so, uh, but I do most of the coaching and, and I don't want you to suffer. You know, you're already suffering. Let's, let's work on, let's not waste time doing bladder therapies when it's very clear if you have involuntary muscle spasms and you have pudendal neuralgia, bladder therapies are pointless. We got to work on the muscles and nerves. Lama says, I, I have pain on the left side of vagina and anus left, uh, late at night between 12 and 3 a.m. Why pain on this side even when I'm relaxing and sleeping? The odds are what you're doing is you're laying on a side that is, um, let's see. I want to, I want to, okay. So let's say, okay, each leg. So you're laying on your side, right? So you got one, you got one leg low and one leg on top of it, right? But the leg that's on top is not parallel. It's actually pointing downward. There's an angle. And if you follow this leg all the way up here, that's going to your SI joint. So one of the things for people who have pain when they sleep on their side is they want you to have a pillow between your knees to keep your legs parallel so that you're not doing this. I got my worst pain ever from my SI joint with a uh, body pillow. Um, that's really when it kicked off. I got in a body pillow. I love that body pillow. I love sleeping with it. I would kind of wrap it around it and I kind of have it between my legs and I kind of contort this way or that way. And that's when whoo, a lot of my SI point pain started that exact moment. So I hope that that makes sense, Lamo. So anyway, well, listen, we've had a pretty good meeting today. We've been going for three and a one half hours. It's pretty good for me. I want to thank you guys for giving me support earlier when I was talking about my dilemma. And I welcome any and all suggestions anybody might have. I was sharing that I have a friend who is um, overwhelming me with um, grief and anger over the war. And um, I'm, be I'm the recipient of a lot of yelling right now, not not that I've done anything wrong. It's just sheer and utter fury over the war. And it's exceeding my ability to cope a bit. So I'm always looking for feedback on that because you guys are my support too. So anyway, well, listen, uh, let's do a last call for questions. Last call for questions. If not... Then, 
So uh, I should be here next week. The week after that, but then we're uh, uh, not going to have any meetings for three weeks because Christmas Eve is on Sunday, New Year's Eve is on Sunday, and so you won't see me probably for three weeks. Uh, I am planning on working most of the time anyway, but um, I w uh, only privately. Um, the IC Network does, I do do coaching. If anybody wants to do coaching, I'm always happy to do that. It's $50 for 30 minutes, but call anyway, because most of the time there's no charge for it. You just have a couple of questions. Not a problem at all. I am, I'm the easiest person you could ever work with, and I'm not going to charge you thousands of dollars for knowledge. Marlia said, thank you, Jill. Is lidocaine used prescription or over the counter? Uh, over the counter. Um, it's a low dose, like five, either 2.5% or 5%. Anacream, A-N-E-C-R-E-A-M, is an over-the-counter lidocaine cream. Um, but if it's compounded, then it's usually a prescription. Don says, are there any studies that prove that IC can worsen with prolapse? They don't need any studies, hon, because IC, remember, we phenotype, and if you're a muscle-driven patient, and you have messed up muscles, either weak muscles or tight muscles, as those muscles get progressively worse and cause your prolapse, that's going to affect your IC too. Uh, Lama said, is it good, is it good for uh, long walks? Um, I do a ton of long walking myself. I think it's important to walk every day. It's important to get out of the house. But you have to listen to your body. Um, I have days when I can walk five miles and I have days when I only walk a mile. I just <clears throat> try to not let my brain stop me. I just try to put my sweatpants on and my, you know, my shoes on and I just get out the door and then I see where my body will take me. So I would say I'm half and half right now with really long walks versus slow walks. Um, but I also really listen to my muscles. And if I'm starting to feel a lot of muscle tension in my thighs, which I often get, uh, because hello, I'm an aging athlete, I tend to back off a little bit. I use a lot of Tiger Balm. I stretch a lot. Um, and I should be doing a lot more weight-bearing exercises, too. You're welcome, Dawn. You're very, very welcome, honey. Debbie Beyond, I need help supplementing with PEA instead of gabapentin. I attempt to wean off of it recently, and my symptoms came back worse than before. Well, you know, you have to work with your doctor on the right way to get off of medications. Gabapentin, um, there may be a very, a very strict protocol that you have to do to go off very gradually to minimize those effects. Um, I'm not an expert in that. Um, here, hold on a sec. Let's see if we can find an article. Speaking of dryness, I got to say, I love doing meetings, but they are the bane of my TMJ. I can feel my jaw getting real tight right now. I'll be wearing a heating pad tonight. So hold on a sec. Um, gabapentin. Let's see. Yeah, you're not supposed to abruptly stop the med. You're supposed to taper. And there are tapering uh, regimens. Um, withdrawal can include insomnia, rebound pain, flu-like symptoms. Let me see if I can give you a link here. Well, this is a this is from uh, the National Health Service of the United Kingdom, but it kind of gives you a clue. But I think you could Google it a little bit more, and Google for gabapentin tapering strategies.
And, you know, there's no reason why you couldn't, you couldn't, you know, start with a little bit of PA at the same time. It's not known to interact with any medications. Um, but you can Google that too. Palmitoyl ethanolamide drug interactions. I, I've done that several times in the last year. I haven't found any yet. And the articles that I've looked at basically say that there are no known drug interactions with PEA. Uh, Debbie says, thank you so much. Shockers are not so willing to help me ever when it comes to that girl. I, I hear you, hon. I hear you. I just listen. If there's like one thing, one take home message for every single person watching this, you are not alone. This is not your fault. You have done absolutely nothing wrong. I don't want you carrying any shame or blame because you're struggling with pelvic pain. You got hurt or you have, or you have an infection or some sort of injury. Not your fault. Hold your head up high, walk into the doctor's office, educated, informed, ready to have a discussion on what your treatment options are. I don't want you to walk into a doctor's office and say, make it all go away. Give me a pill. That's ridiculous. You are an anatomical mystery to be solved. We have got to study your pelvis a little bit more to try to figure out what's driving these symptoms, like with Evie. You know, with her pudendal neuralgia, her quivering muscles, there's no doubt that's injury related. That's not her bladder at all. Um, you know, but it's like peeling an onion. There are layers and layers and layers. And sometimes you have to let your doctor do their due process. And you guys, if you find these meetings helpful, please come on over to the IC Network and at least sign up for our free newsletter. It's an email newsletter. I'll be sending out three in the next coming week. I've got a new clinical trial coming out. I've got a, one, a, a self-help tip coming out. I've got a regular newsletter coming out. Um, and if you like what I do, please think about becoming a member of the IC Network so you can get our fabulous magazine, The IC Optimist, of which our latest issue is awesome. Where do I have it? I just had it here. What did I do with it? Well, anyway, you can see pictures of it on the website. It's a 36-page magazine, and that's where we do absolutely our best work. It's in our magazine. Okay. Excellent. Excellent, W. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Happy holidays. And may we all be treating everybody with kindness and love because the world needs it right now. And if you can, stay off of social media, get outside, laugh, do things that are funny, get back to your family and friends, okay? It's a hard time right now. I'll see you guys later. Oh, by the way, I'm wearing my Auntie Mister's ring. How do you like that? I needed her support today because I wasn't feeling so well this morning. Auntie, everybody says I'm the Auntie Muster of my generation. She was an empath. She worked for the Red Cross. I've got some, I got a recognition here and I just inherited her ring. All right, guys, I'll see you later. We're going to say goodbye to YouTube first. Be well. YouTube.